Okay. A warm good afternoon, all of you. I welcome uh, Professor Yoko Kato, uh, other ACNN and ACNS board members, the speakers, session chairs, and all the delegates. Uh, a warm welcome uh, to this webinar, ninth webinar, ACNN webinar on, on skull based lesions and its management. Myself, Shani, session. Let me introduce, uh, welcome Professor Kato for the opening remarks. Off to you, ma'am. Yes, uh, everyone. Uh, hello, how are you? So thank you very much for joining our webinar. Um, I think our link is extended uh, the widely, so uh, maybe we can have more the young uh, nurses, I think, in the future. Uh, today's very nice guest, uh, of course, Amal and Zari, and uh, the two nurses. So uh, we look forward to your lectures. Thank you very much. Raja, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, the modern neurosurgical techniques, diagnostic imaging, intraoperative neuro navigation, and endoscopic technology have remarkably changed the concept of skull-based surgeries. Thus, the treatment of skull-based surgeries or tumors has evolved from observation to partial resection, combined with other therapy, other therapy modalities to gross total resection and no adjuvant treatment and with good surgical outcome and excellent clinical outcome. Due to the limited space within the posterior fossa, adequate bony exposure and early CSM training are essential. Hydrocephalus is also common Okay, I think so there is some problem with the internet. Oh, Timo, you can start. Okay, we can go to so Timo directly. Timo, kindly unmute your mic. Okay, excuse me. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, respected Professor Yoko Kato. Uh, thank you, Yi Yi uh, Cheng, uh, for this uh, organizing for this very important uh, webinar. Uh, in collaboration of, uh, between the ACNS and also ACNN. Uh, it is very, very crucial for our community. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce our uh, first speaker, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Ahmed Ansari, uh, an esteemed neurosurgeon specializing in various fields within neurosurgery. Dr. Ansari uh, currently holds uh, the position of assistant professor in the Department of uh, neurosurgery at Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College uh, in India. Uh, with a remarkable academic background and a passion for advancing the field of neurosurgery, Dr. Ansari has made significant contribution to his field. Uh, he obtained his uh, specialty neurosurgery from Sawaiman Singh Medical College, Jaipur, Rajasthan, India. And also additionally, he completed his uh, last fellowship uh, in minimal invasive and endoscopic spine surgery uh, from uh, Korean, South Korean uh, uh, neurosurgical department in Seoul. And also uh, he completed the fellowship in cerebrovascular and also uh, skull-based surgery at Fujita Health University Bantane Hospital in Nagoya, Japan under the supervision of Professor Yoko Kato. Also he holds honorary uh, associate professor uh, degree uh, from that university. So, uh, it is, uh, we are fortunate to have Dr. Ahmed Ansari as a speaker in today's webinar on topic, uh, skull-based tumor and overview and surgical management. Uh, his vast experience and expertise uh, will undoubtedly contribute to an enriching discussion and further uh, our understanding of this intricate field. Uh, please join us uh, in this uh, webinar. Thank you. Professor oh, Ahmed, please oh, open thank your you, Tengu. Uh, so nice to have all of you in here and a very good evening to all of you. It is my pleasure to be invited in here and uh, being this uh, a neuro nursing uh, webinar platform, I think I would be limiting myself to the most crisp points which are related to which are related to 
to the betterment of all for needle for needles and nursing people uh, am i able to share my screen in here please please can i uh, is my shared screen visible no, no, in here you have to share again okay kindly open your powerpoint and then click share screen is it open now is yeah, it open now it's fine perfect and uh, can you see the complete screen in here now raja waiting Uh, yes. Can you see the complete screen now? Yes, now we can see that. Fine. We can go ahead, please. Ahmed. Yeah. Am I freeze? Yes. Oh, it's, it's good to go. go. It's good to okay. go. Okay. Uh, uh, I've been given the responsibility to go. Project uh, management, mainly pertaining for new nursing, for uh, for new nursing people. So, skin tumors, as is uh, widely known, it encompasses a wide range of tumors. Starting and collaborating with our colleagues from the ENT, auto, and laryngology side, plastic surgery side, and some people from surgical oncology side. As uh, a kid growing in the 80s and 90s, I was extremely, uh, uh, I was extremely, uh, very much uh, amazed. By the skills of Bruce Lee, and that's why I usually start my presentation with his words: "A man must constantly exceed his level, and he should never be satisfied with the present, and that always think that the next operation should always be better than the previous one." And pertaining to skull, this particularly challenging things are interesting. Easy job is boring. Do not pray for an easy life. Pray for the strength to endure a difficult one. That's one of the most important things. To learn and go upon. Starting from the cranial fossa, you can see over here the cranial fossa. It is basically made up or divided into three important parts: the anterior, middle, and the posterior cranial fossa. The anterior cranial fossa, as the word is suggesting, it lies towards the front aspect or the anterior portion, surrounded by the surrounded by the anteriorly. It is surrounded by the frontal bone, posteriorly by the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. Followed by an anterior process and the sulcus chiasmaticus. These are these are the boundaries for the anterior cranial fossa. On the median plane, we can see that it is surrounded by the cribriform plate and the body of the sphenoid bone. On the sides, you can again see that there is the orbital plate of the frontal bone and the wings of the sphenoid. You can see that it is surrounded anteriorly by the lesser wing of the sphenoid again. The anterior cranial process and the sulcus chiasmaticus. Posteriorly, what we can see, we can see the superior border of petrous temporal and the dorsum of the sphenoid. Literally, again, we can see that there is a greater wing of sphenoid, anterior inferior angle of parietal bone, and squamous part of the temporal bone. Medially, again, there is the body of the sphenoid. Literally, there is a greater wing of sphenoid and the squamous and anterior surface of temporal bones. Going to the third part, which is the posterior cranial fossa, we can see that it is surrounded entirely by the petrous temporal bone and the dorsum celli of the sphenoid bone. Posteriorly, there is the squamous part of the occipital bone, and on each side, we can see that there is the mastoid part of the temporal bone and parietal and a portion of the parietal bone, just to complete the posterior cranial fossa. Medially, again, we can see that there is the clivus. The large opening at the base, which is the foramen magnum, and the squamous occipital. Laterally, again, there is the condylar portion of the occipital bone, petrous and mastoid part of temporal bone, and the mastoid angle of the pit of the parietal bone. A very important part, which encompasses the cranial fossa or the cranial base, is the Meckel scape, which is just a dual imagination at the posterior aspect of the cavernous sinus containing the gasserian ganglion. The dural layers show thin peripheral enhancement. We can see over here in MRI. We can also see the three divisions of the cranial of fifth. Now these skull-based regions, how are they basically divided? So Irish et al. They they have divided the skull-based regions into three regions: region one, two, and three. The region one it extends and includes the anterior cranial fossa till the level of the clivus, the slant which we can see over here, which is the clivus. The region two, which is the middle fossa, along with the infratemporal fossa and the pterygopalatine fossa, 
and the last this is the region 3 which is the posterior fossa again the lesions of region 1 which we can see over here it can encompass the uh, the lesions which arise from the sinuses or the orbit and they can be accessed either by an open traditional anterior canal for roaches or by an endoscopic approach through the uh, through the nostrils lesions in the region 2 it can be accessed infra temporal by the through an temporal approach with a hemicoronal or a bicoronal incision, we can either ex expose it by a temporal approach with hemicoronal incision, or it may be combined with a removal of a part of the mandible or a transtemporal approach. Finally, there is lesions in the region 3, which are the lesions around the ear and temporal, which can be approached by the transtemporal approaches. Now, this is a very brief classification as we can see that there are lesions in the anterior fossa. These, these, these are mostly originating or might be a part which uh, is originating, the lesion is originating below the skull base, either arising from the sinuses or nose and then going upwards, or they can be a part of the dura at the base of the anterior portion, or it can be a part of the brain in itself. So most commonly, what we encounter in the region one anterior part are the sinonasal carcinomas, which can either be squamous cell, basal, mucosal melanomas, adenocystic or adenocarcinoma. Very important are the clavel chordomas and esthesioneuroblastomas. Region two, as this is the portion mainly comprising of the Mikkel's cave, we see a lot of schwannomas, meningiomas, infiltrating nasopharyngeal carcinomas. We can see the glomus tumors arising around it the infiltrating portion of the juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, a part of the clavel chordoma which has infiltrated or moved towards the middle canal fossa. In the region 3, again, we can see a lot of chondrosarcomas, glomus tumors, squamous cell carcinomas, and basal cell carcinomas. Now, uh, starting from the very anterior aspect, that is the anterior canal fossa, it might be infiltrated by various lesions which are arising from the nasal cavity and the paranasal sinuses. Again, as we can see over here, anteriorly we can see frontal sinuses, ethmoid, ethmoid sinuses, and the spin sinuses. Again, there is a nasal cavity, the lesions of each of which can might infiltrate and go inside into the anterior canal fossa. We see most of the tumors that are arising from the nasal cavity and the paranasal sinuses, most of the tumors that are arising from either from the maxilla nasal cavity or the frontal bone. These comprise the majority of the tumors which go towards the anterior canal fossa. And the histology findings, mostly these are the lesions which are either squamous cell carcinomas, they are either melanomas or esthesioneuroblastomas. What we have over here is the very base of the brain, below the anterior canal fossa, the tumors arising from the maxilla and their roots of the spread. Now there is this Ongren's line which the surgical oncology people who collaborate most of the time with us for the tumors which have infiltrated into the base of the brain. So this is this line, Ongren's line, which is the line which connects the medial canthus to the angle of mandible. So any lesion which is anterior superiorly, it has got a better prognosis as compared to all the lesions which are at the inferior portion of these lines. Now we can see as there is the lesion inside the maxilla, it can spread to any aspect. It can go towards the nasal cavity, it can go towards the uh, palate, it can go towards the orbit, it, or it can go into the base of the brain. This is the same thing which might happen with the ethmoid roots of spread. Lesions from the ethmoid sinuses, it might spread towards the sponoid sinuses, into the nostril, into the, into the nasopharyngeal spaces, or might go towards the frontal sinus or into the internal fossa. Same again, as we are seeing in here, that lesions arising from the frontal sinuses, they have a very high chance of getting spread into the nasal cavity, nasopharyngeal spaces, into the anterior canal fossa, or going outwards towards the skin. Now, these are most of the tumors of these things are mostly very underrated and very underestimated tumors because most of these tumors are dealt with the surgical oncology or the specialized field with the ENT people. Till the time they reach to us, most of the, these tumors have reached to a very late stage. And that's why they are very unrecognized in comparison uh, 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 within breach of the neurosurgeons. The same thing is with the spinoid sinuses, either going into the cella, towards the endocrine fossa, into the nasopharyngeal space, towards the clivus, or into the nostril. 
we can see over here there are the tumors in the nasal cavity just adjacent to the middle turbinate over here or the tumor lying into the ethmoid in here same thing we can see uh, uh, a contrast sarcoma which came into the histo uh, into uh, into the histopath finding there is this large ct scan axial view so between bony window which is showing a large lesion uh, uh, into the sinuses and then reaching till the uh, till the base till the base of the cranium the coronal images which are showing infiltrating tumor which has gone into the orbit gone gone towards the nostril invaded the whole of the of, of, of the nasal cavities now why is the skull base anatomy very complex and the surgery which are for these tumors which are exactly lined into these bases very complex i would say there are four important things which makes the anatomy as well as being very 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 complex one is the fear of csf leak again it's not just the, just the fear once the travel of csf leak begins in the patient it's ultimately the patient who pays once the patient they start getting subtle signs of meningitis or gets or lands up into meningitis it's just the patient who has to face each and every table of, of uh, each and every trouble of course we are the ones who have to manage them but it's one of the most gruesome complications that might occur with any surgeon or with any patient the fear of csf leak again the fear of hemorrhage because there is a fear of many structures which are, which are lying hidden at the base of the brain inadequate exposure and incomplete resection these are the four most important points which makes the complex anatomy of the skull base and the surgery a bit challenging now there are several advantages of going for an external skull base surgery as well as for going in for a main way of approach of course as our surgical oncology and ent collaboration they might lead with with our, within with a wide exposure a wide resection or a monobrow resection as is the guideline with many surgical oncology people for getting a piece of the clear cut margin that is devoid of any any, uh, any tumor pathology also a dural repair or a graft is better there is good reconstruction with free flaps if the if there is pathology overlying uh, overlying the sphenoid sinuses or ethmoid sinuses and infiltrating over the skin of the face there is a good reconstruction with free flaps along with our plastic colleagues and outcomes data are available these are obviously better techniques this is just a highlight of uh, of a collaborative technique of a tumor which might have been in the ethmoid sinuses and going at the base of the brain both a pericranial flap has been taken over here and a facial flap has been taken over here in this we can see that the, uh, uh, the uh, that the drilling and removal of a part of the cristagaline cuneiform plate to reach towards the base has been taken out these are just the just some of the images of uh, histopath findings for adenocarcinoma of the ethmoid which has infiltrated into the base of the brain incision taking a wide exposure a monoblock resection and the final image of the of the, of the patient of course these these were these all were taken with the help of our plastic and ent colleagues again malignant fibrous fibrous histocytoma uh, what we can see over it, it has involved in gone into the orbit damaged the nerves and the patient was uh, uh, patient did not didn't had any vision on the left side a complete resection was performed followed by a free flap over here frontal sinus tumors what we can see over here the patient is having an overlapping at the uh, at, at the last pack the tumor was removed by a, a bicranial incision complete tumor excision was done and the final image now the progress in skull is uh, as we can see initially starting from the, six, the decade of 60s in which there was just the introduction and there was a very Don't wide skepticism to these tumors followed by the decade in the 70s where there was huge enthusiasm with regard to these tumors how should we deal with it what is the final final uh, final outcome of, of these patients what was the histopathology diagnosis followed by in 80s there was aggressive techniques for the for these tumors experience started coming from 90s or with its techniques and the complications that followed with it in the 2000s we reached with the realities and the outcomes followed by quality of life index measurement the cost effectiveness of various techniques and the ethics that should be followed from 2005 onwards we started following the endoscopic approaches and now starting from the 2010s decades till now where are we right now 
just some images of uh, uh, of going towards the base of the okay. brain but uh, with the bicornal incision and uh, uh, with, with the bicornal incision given uh, the flap taken on the side of the sinus and then going towards the base of the again the skull based reconstruction why is it so much important the skull based reconstruction after taking out the tumor again might be reconstructed with the help of a very the flap or the <laughs> tissue which is overlying or around the flap which we have the skin flap that we have raised upon the gallial peritoneal flap the facio cutaneous free flap or the myocutaneous free flap in case of huge tumors and uh, in which we have taken out the huge tumors along with the part of the bone on the skin which is covering over the face or a part of the cranium now this fascia you see it is very important for the reconstruction at the, at the at the base of the skull so most of the time talking right now uh, they are basically pertaining for neuro for neuro for neuro nurses each and every part or each and every technique would take several hours and hours of its lecture for its better completion i would say uh, i'll just be talking very briefly on some of these things so just like olfactory neuroblastoma the things which are very very common olfactory neuroblastomas these are the malignant neoplasms of neuroplorigen had a bimodal incidence peaks presents mainly with nasal stuffiness and bleeding what we can see over here is a t1 weighted image uh, t1 weighted images of a homogeneously enhancing tumor in the right nasal cavity and has a huge intracranial extension over here of, of course the tumor came out to be olfactory neuroblastoma uh, or a cco neuroblastoma as we can say in here what we can again see that there is uh that there is a nasopharyngeal carcinoma in the 63 year old lady this is uh, these are the these are the coronal long contrast t1 imaging which are showing the nasopharyngeal mucosal wall thickening again it has gone up towards the left cavernous sinus along the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve left side left trigeminal nerve and we can see again intermediate insensitivity along the maxillary branch of the left trigeminal nerve so studying of these all these lesions in proper mr imaging is very very crucial for the final planning and management of tumors these final planning and management ultimately decides the final outcome for these patients now going towards the antecranial fossa one of the most uh, wonderful tumors that the new surgeons mostly encounter for are the feature free adenomas we can see briefly over here this is a 38 year old man usually the feature free adenomas that we new surgeons love to operate upon are the are the cellular supracellular lesions which are mostly lying in the cella going upwards they are the they are the soft mildly vascular and is this the cavern tumors now these are there are again some other some other sort of feature free adenomas as we can see in this 38 year old man uh, that even the t1 weighted imaging showing a large infiltrating uh, lesion which had invaded the bone also and there is intertumor hemorrhage which we can see over here again the main vessels are just engulfing inside the inside this tumor we can see differently we can see the ct scan is showing erosion of all the bony structures around here so these are all these tumors are the are the ones which require collaboration of different specialties and a very broad knowledge and very huge experience and practice in order to operate upon them and give a wonderful result for these patients coming uh, coming again to uh, to one of the other most uh, encountered one are the chondrosarcomas the skull based chondrosarcomas are they are thought to arise from the cartilage and bone they occur at all ages from the teens into the into the 90s typical clinical symptoms they include sickness paralysis and headache what we can see in here it's a huge skull based chondrosarcoma what we are seeing in here is a t1 weighted expansile hypo intense mass lesion you can you can see the mass lesion over here which is engulfing the left side petrous which has engulfed and a part of the clivus which has again gone out for the tumor the epicenter of this tumor is lying at the left side petroclival fissure in here what we can see we are, what we are seeing uh, again that the left side mastoid cells they have lost their aeration and again as the mastoid cells have lost their lost their aeration the eustachian likely because this eustachian tube is obstructed in here what we can see that there there is fat suppression over here and punctate calcification obviously along with this destruction of the bony margins can be seen very clearly in this sort of skull based chondrosarcomas of course the prognosis of for these patients are not very good here again what we are seeing is a trigeminal schwannoma one of the most frequently encountered one in the middle cranial fossa or the middle cranial fossa tumors 
We are seeing this in a 38-year-old male arising from the Mikkels cave. This is a T2-weighted imaging. This is showing a dumbbell, dumbbell-shaped tumor, partly cystic, partly solid structure, uh, 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 resting in the left side paracellar space. This is the cellar spaces. This is the, uh, this is the paracellar spaces. And going into the left side pterygoid palatine fossa, like the sagittal, uh, sagittal contrast images, we can see that there's fat separation and uh, schwannoma of the second bunch of the trigeminal nerve was confirmed during surgery. For posterior fossa, cranial fossa surge, uh, uh, tumors, we can see that this is a jugular foramen schwannoma in this uh, 55 years old male. This is the posterior fossa you can see in here. And uh, axial T2 imaging shows showing a mix and cystic masses extending to the left side jugular foramen. In here, we can see this is the post contrast imaging. Again, it's showing a heterogeneous enhancement of the tumors. Bone metastasis, again, these are very, very common, at least in the developing world of our side. These are very undiagnosed, I would say. And uh, because most of the patients who after bone metastasis into the skull, if they are presenting to a neurosurgeon, it's very, very late till the time they present to us. And, they, and that's why very few of these patients are presenting to us for at least for treatment. Of course, radiotherapy or systemic chemotherapy are frequent of treatment for these patients. What we are seeing over here is in a 53-year-old female with a history of breast cancer. We can see on contrast imaging, there is uh, 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 there is this bony tumor in the uh, there is this bony tumor into the right into the right side petal surface, which is dumbbell, uh, which can, which does not resemble anything just like the from the opposite side petal surface. Again, a non-contrast T1 imaging clearly delineates this hyperintense tumor. Now, uh, each of these tumor. Now, each of these tumor, as, uh, as we have briefly talked about, so the anterior tumors, also the tumors which are from the, uh, from the nose and the paranasal spinuses, the going into the intracranial fossa, the tumors that are rising from the middle cranial fossa, the most common tumors which might have arisen from the posterior cranial fossa, all of these tumors have got some different surgical approaches in order to deal with them. Of course, most of these of, of the of these approaches are very very familiar for the surgeons, and while some of them are not very familiar for them. Of course, I will be talking a very uh, very very briefly and touching some of the most subtle and most vital points for these approaches. Coming right to the funeral approach, of course, yes, Sargil laid the foundation for the funeral approach in the 70s. It was mainly done to address the circle loss and also pathological changes in the cavernous sinus area. So it is rightly said to be the workhorse approach in cranial surgery. Very, very familiar to neurosurgeons, it is simple, expandable, move to many other different approaches, going towards the frontal side, going mic towards the, uh, towards the uh, temporal side, can be extended into the form of a simple transcabinous also, easy to perform, exposes a very large area towards the paracellar spaces, and provides a generous number of walking space. We can see that we can go between the optic nerves. We can, we can go between the optic and cat. We can go between the carotid and ocular motor nerve. So it provides a wide, wide area of walking. Of course, opening of the cilium is the most important aspect in dealing with these tumors. Now, the term teron, it was derived from the Greek word teron, which refers to the wings that were attached to the head of Hermes, who was the messenger of the Greek gods. It evolved further with the contribution of many new surgeons of the past century, and rightly the credit should be given to Sir Victor Hoss, who had operated innumerable number of PTT tumors from the frontal approach and faced difficulty, and initially it was said to be inoperable tumors also. Now, uh, I, I got this wonderful slide showing an illustration of the Cushing's transfrontal approach. Here we can see that the position of the bone flap here this was the cranial, the anterior of the nose and the, and, the, and the eyes of the patient. We can see the position of the bone flap in here, the retraction that he had given to retract the dura of the orbital roof and the sphenoid, and the sphenoid bone. You can see again the exposure of the right side optic nerve and the lesion. So beautiful, they have already demonstrated. And this was the era which was without, uh, without, uh, without any usage of micro. So anything which we are standing right now, are on the shoulders and the work that our uh, that our uh, that our great teachers have already done, and it is our luxury, I would say, 
that we should if uh, if we didn't uh, move neurosurgery to first patients from here then i don't think we have just we have done justice to our lives again historical perspective uh, there were certain different type of incisions that were used by different uh, the, by different uh, famous and legendary surgeons right starting from nathan uh, nathal gomes who used a, just a small cavilinia to stress the who move just the frontal side a uh, relatively straight incision used by brock or by dandy a cavilinia question mark incision or a sargil or by or the one that was original one that was used by a sargil uh, a relatively curved one Tibial again anatomy is the region which is the which is the junction for four bones: frontal, frontal, parietal, sphenoid bone, and the upper bone. It is the weakest part of the skull and the anterior division of the mandible meningeal artery. It runs underneath the tibial. Again, sinal fissure opening is one of the most important aspects in going towards the tibial approach. This approach grants as grants as to the various cisterns, whether it be interoptic cistern, going. uh going between the optic nerve or the carotid or the carotid of the ocular motor we can see the tumor tumor uh, tumor lying uh, tumor lying around the around these cisterns we can see the division of the ica into anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery and the tumor and delving around it again there is the mini tibial craniotomy and which is just a cavilinian scalp incision which starts was this 1 cm above the zygomatic arch and goes towards the base at the anterior part of the hairline extending superiorly and it curves gradually up to the superior temporal line skin is retracted uh, retracted forwards the this bone muscle is again incised leaving behind a small malar facial cuff and the bone flap should never exceed 4 cm in diameter so again this is a mini tenor can help me again as a sub a sub type for the tenoral approach that we new surgeons are very very much familiar with This, these are these are just some of the intraoperative images for of the tumors in left internal approach. We can see the tumor behind the internal carotid artery. In front, we can see the left side optic nerve. We can see the bifurcation into the MC and and the and the and the ACA. Going laterally, we can also we would have been seeing the glomerular nerve had we gone just, uh, just more just more laterally. Here we can see just after the removal of the tumor, we can see the uh, the appearance of the pituitary stalk uh, stalk, which can be seen behind the suction. in here coming towards the other approach this is the frontal lateral approach what we are seeing right now in here the frontal lateral approach or the unilateral subfrontal approach it is obviously a minimal invasive approach for olfactory group olfactory group meningiomas olfactory group again it's the it's the tumors which are lying towards the anterior part mainly at the base of the intracranial fossa involving a part of the of the cystagli even even up till the level of cystagli and going going much much down from there coming to the transcranial approaches transcranial approaches again pertaining to various lesions which are lying at the anterior canal fossa it was first used by the egyptians in order to remove the brain and the pioneer work of harvey kitching and oscar hirsch led to one of the most efficient ways to operate in this region so victor hosley was again the first as we all know it was the first to operate on the pituitary gland starting from from the uh, from these various approaches in order to reach the trans in order in order to go by the transcranial approaches as we have all seen right during our residency days when the sublavial behind the below the below below the lips from one side going towards the septum and going towards the transspinoidal approach it was being used then followed there was this transnasal transseptal approach in which uh, through the nose an incision was given the septa was reached it was followed till the level of vomer going into the sphenoid bone reaching till the base of the cella removing the bone and then accessing the dura and the lesion in here we are seeing that the nasal speculum has been brought upon after the incision of the of the of the nasal septum then came the endoscopic era in which there was this two nostril approach in which the endoscope was brought in uh, into one of the nostrils going inside the nostril re removing a part of the middle turbinate from one side or just lateralizing it taking out the head art flap going towards the septum reaching the vomer and then making a space towards for working towards the opposite side so we can see over here that the endoscope is going towards uh, in one nostril and the uh, instruments are going towards the other side again it might be it might be taken as a free hand endoscope technique or might be used with the help of a of a of an endoscope holder also 
although mostly for most new users or for most uh, surgeons who are who are particularly familiar with the endoscopic approaches they do use uh, uh, the freehand technique till the level they reach the cellar flow obviously most of the surgeons or some of them at least they use freehand technique uh, while taking out the tumor as well while others would be using an endoscope holder while take while while even filling the base of the cella and then opening the dura and taking out the tumor and here is the tradition take the incision inside the nasal ostium the partial dissection of the bony septum was done opening of the cellar floor as we can all see and the dura is being exposed exposed and open and the tumor being taken out these uh, this is the traditional one that is being followed now again one of the most important things is creating one's own surgical surgical site absorb what is useful discard what is not add what is uniquely your own i am a firm believer of the fact that any surgery which is simple which is clean it automatically becomes fast every surgery has its some very useful steps and if somehow a surgeon leaves some of these steps unfortunately or fortunately maybe at times he may he might have landed up in some sort of bleeding or some sort of problem that makes the surgery a bit lengthier than it should have been so one should always always see the masters working out what they are seeing what things they are not doing what is the position of holding the endoscope uh, inside the holder where is the attendant uh, where is the assistant standing how is the nurse working around the surgeon and the assistant that is one of the most important things what are the instruments that the surgeon what is the position of his fingers and his hands is asking for and how is the neuro nurse who is standing beside him or behind him or side to him is handing all these instruments to him just seeing at the monitor that is one of the most at most important thing for neuro nursing people going with some extended endoscopic techniques which you can see that the regions of the skull situated in the midline these are accessible to the endoscopic surgery it can either be the olfactory cleft it can either be planar sphenoidal a part of the cella going into the clivus till the region we are reaching till the cervico occipital junction so it can be either a transfrontal approach it can be through the through the cuneiform plate transform it can be transplanum transcellular transclival or transodontoid approach all of these can be done with an endoscope in extended techniques i will just showcase some images otherwise it will be taking so too much time in here it's just the inferior view of the skull base in which we can see uh which, which we can see uh the white starting from the coronal uh, from the from this the uh this is the coronal plane anterior fossa in here we can see the coronal plane middle fossa and the posterior fossa the area that has reached in cases of transodontoid approach the area reached with the transclavical approach with the transphenoid transplanum or the transclavical so all of these regions can be approached with the help of an extended endoscopic approaches towards the skull base what we are seeing over here is the usage of an intraoperative endoscopic image with a 45 degree endoscope is being used for olfactory neuroblastoma these uh, these are the images of our ent colleagues also now this time uh, this was an extended uh, endonasal transcaviform approach sharp dissection and biomanual techniques to dissect the tumor related to the olfactory bulb at the base of the frontal lobes was done of course the fox was transected also uh, usually for people who are very much experienced they might have they might also argue that going in for operating for large olfactory group meningiomas with these trans approaches is also possible of course it is possible we do recommend and we do operate the very small olfactory group meningiomas so these approaches only of course in here what we are seeing it's a very large olfactory group meningioma going through the uh, going through the nostril one of the biggest advantages is we can devascularize the tumor very early. and once the tumor has been devascularized removing the dura with a gentle extra capsular dissection and the intraoperative uh, debulking it takes out the tumor very very beautifully although there is a very huge huge gap left which should be filled and completed very meticulously otherwise there is huge chances for csf leak and damage to the and huge damage to the patient of course these are these sort of tumors can all be taken out very beautifully with the, with the help of open traditional bicoronal subfrontal approaches And here, these are some of the some of the tumors which can be taken out with these endoscopic approaches. We can see uh, pituitary adenomas with significant supercell extension, craniopharyngeomas with a huge cystic portion, meningiomas going towards the transplanum involving the tubercular portion also, 
all of course managing of the tuberculum also they can all be removed with the help of an extended endoscopic approaches this is a view of, with a zero degree endoscopic during the section of a of a kind of angioma with the transplantum approach we can see the pituitary lying below the tumor which was involved with the, with the, with the pituitary stalk it is always better for us we just leave the pituitary stalk as such even if it is being involved with the tumor otherwise the child ends up in so huge hormonal imbalances that it's very very tough to manage at times and we have uh, we are very unfortunate to to lose some of our earlier patients now these are uh, uh, this is the final uh, this is the removal of tuberculum meningioma the pre operative and post operative picture in here we can see the uh, the major vessels surrounding it and uh, the intra operative picture in which the carotids and the optic nerve can be seen very very beautifully in with in here the transclavical approach of course it's going below the cella region and there is a very very high chance for for uh, uh, for damage to the ica while drilling this while drilling the uh, the clavical area of course if it's a purely clavical cordoma lying inside the bone very uh, it's very easy i would say just going below the cella removing the removing the outer shell of the bone you land up directly inside the tumor take out as much of the tumor as possible in fact we would say that take out Get get a good cross sectional resection because there's a there's a one thing that that the best uh, prognosis for these patients. Of course, a final trans uh, the transclavical approach following a clavical resection, we can we can see the basal artery, PCA, posterior cerebral artery, and superior cerebral artery. These are again the anatomical specimen uh, uh, with an intraoperative view of the left side CP angle. In here, it's a zero degree endoscope showing that uh, showing the transorbital approach. we can uh, we can we can cut uh, we can remove the right cell lamina and the anterior skull folds uh, skull base bone is still intact in this in this cases as can be seen with endoscope or with any other technique keeping on practicing doing practicing repeatedly is one of the most most important aspect as rightly said by bruce lee i fear not the man who has practiced 10000 kicks once but i fear the man who has practiced one kick 10000 times so that's very important even if one is doing one particular surgery he is so much well versed with all the techniques with all its steps that he gives the best prognosis for for these patients as uh, these are some of the some of the very toughest of tough surgeries going with the posterior fossa approaches uh, the ones which are which are most commonly used by the new surgeons is the, the retrosigmoid approach and uh, there there are there are there are a whole lot of surgeons who who uh, who operate these patients in patients in the semi sitting position or it can also be operated either in the prone position with the head lying towards the opposite side or in the lateral two lateral position or the fast bench position so i would say it depends on the surgeon preference although getting a patient in the semi sitting or sitting position has its advantages of a good brain relaxation first the clean surgical field as the blood would be going towards gravity towards the flow by itself so it has its own advantages of course the disadvantage lies uh, lies in uh, in the fact that there is a chances for venous embolism also again as we are going towards the uh, uh, towards the clavicular lesions what we can see over here the whole clavicle in the petroclavicular region it can be divided into three zones the zone 1 2 and 3 the zone 1 it starts right from the dorsum cellae to the level of the internal artery canal the zone one it lies on from the internal artery canal to the jugular tubercle and the zone three lies downwards in the level of reaching towards the foramen magnum now zone one it can be exposed by the cavasse approach or the anterior petrosal approach if the tumor is involving only the cellular region of zone one meaning behind the cella it can be approached by a transcellular transcavernous that's why i was saying that the peroneal approach can be modified into various different approaches if one has if one has seen and worked upon with cadavers again for zone 2 approaches it comes with the posterior petrosal approach again all these approaches the anti petrosal or the posterior approaches they are with respect to the removal of a part or the whole of the petrous bone zone 3 again it can be exposed by a transcondylar approach or the extreme far lateral approaches there is the angle petroclavicular angle which is the angle between the petrous bone and the clavus and the central clavicular depression which we can see anti petrosal approach very briefly it's a subtemporal or frontotemporal craniotomy and anti petrosectomy it is always better to go with a lumbar drain with these approaches 
uh, once uh, uh, once the uh, once there is there is uh, once once we have reached the middle triangular fossa phase, uh, it's uh, uh, we have exposed the Kawasis triangle, which is the greatest, uh, which is the GSPN lying on one side, the Peters region, the arcuate eminence. We start building the Peters bone very 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 uh, very meticulously. After the drilling of the of the of this bone, we reach the posterior fossa dura. I think this era we can gain access to a lot of pathologies at the base of the of the tumor at the junction of the middle and the posterior canal fossa. This is the final view. We can even reach with this transcavernous antepetrosal approach. We can we can reach a lot of vascular artery lesions also. This is one of the most beautiful techniques in order to reach around the vascular vascular artery and working around the vascular artery, removing a part of the tentorium also. Opens it opens the gateway of techniques in order to reach. Uh, reach the region around the basilar artery or in the zone one, which is from the from the dorsum cellae till the level of the internal auditory canal. Again, posterior petrosal approach. We can see that there are different approaches going around around these uh, uh, going around the pinna. We can we can uh, uh, we, uh, it comprises of removing a part of the uh, removing the temporal going uh, going into the pre segmoid space. And it's the law, along with a small late for later sigmoid craniectomy is being done. These are the structures which can be which we can be visualized very easily. The whole lot of the lone loves it can be visualized very easily. So I think uh, I uh, I've covered most of the things um, basically pertaining to the to the nursing people who are just the guiding force. And I uh, I would say just a, such a huge helping force for all the neurosurgeons lying in here. And understanding of all these lesions is also very much important. So as not to avoid any further damage to the patient, which can be uh, beautifully inscripted with this image, which was of, the, of this uh, of this surgery, which was done in 1847 by surgeon Robert Liston. He had amputated a mass leg in two and a half minutes. He performed the surgery so quickly that he accidentally amputated the fingers of his assistant as well. So both the patient and the assistant they died from gangrene, and there was this spectator who was who was sitting in the audience died from fright. So this has made this surgery. The only operation in history, 300% mortality. One patient, one person who was being assistant died, and one person from the audience he died. So it is very, very, uh, very, very important to have a good collaboration with our colleagues, have a good understanding of the pathology, have a wonderful team in order to have a very good result for these patients. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Ansari, um, for this lecture. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ahmed Ansari, uh, for this uh, very insightful presentation. Uh, now let me uh, thank you, introduce uh, uh, the uh, commentators, our panel of commentators. Please, if you have any suggestions, questions, yeah. and comments, please uh, feel free. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ansari. So you just reviewed several kind of scalabes approaches, including the peroneal and- uh, I'm not able to hear. My screen just froze. Okay. Pardon? And, uh, and uh, front lateral, of course, and you mentioned about the uh, endoscopic and nasal approach and extended approach. And uh, finally, you, show, you, sh you mentioned about the lateral suboccipital approach. So you you performed you did there so uh so wide range of scar based approaches in your surgery, and uh, my first question is to how to recon reconstruct of the scar base when you perform the uh, scar base region. So if, of course you you mentioned about you perform the surgery so rapidly, nine surgery nine cases uh before the seven p.m including in the three oper operation rooms. So so you, why can you perform so rapid surgery to doing the reconstructing the scarabus region? This is my first question. Thank you. I don't think reconstructing the scarabus rapidly, it's of much use. And uh, uh, the surgeries that have been shown, it's not being performed on the same day. It's, uh, it's just not like that. One of the most important things for scarabus reconstruction, obviously in all these tumors, I would say what we do is, we take a, a very good facial facial graph, a very good facial graph along with the 
what we perform the technique of touching this facial graft is we perform two layer touching with the help of pins facial latter what what we usually do we place one part of the graft over the other and stitch it out so as the dura that has been cut out totally after filling it with the fat layer we tuck one of the layer of the of the fascia inside the dura that has been exposed all around and just the other layer of the of the fascia which has been kept it lies outside we pull that layer outside towards us that base we make it a watertight area nothing can go inside nothing can go out mm -hmm. which is followed by a first layer of fibrin glue that is again followed by a second layer of the bony area that has been the bony graft that has been taken out this is followed by third layer of the head art flap that we usually in most of our cases we take out a very big a, a layer of uh, layer of layer of head art it, it is being taken in, in in each of our cases the head art flap so we make a watertight three layer a uh, three layer closure for all these patients which have an endoscopic extended or or a simple layer in which case of lee this is again followed by a lumbar drain which lies between 3 to 5 days in almost all of our patients which have a csf leak on table so i think water tight csf uh, uh, dura closure is one of the most important part for oh. uh, in these surgeries and it is one of the most important steps to have a complete full proof water closure a complete a complete basis skull is Uh, skull skull base repair otherwise the patient would land up in so much trouble starting from hormonal disbalance starting from meningitis it's the uh, once the meningitis lands up in the patient's very very tough the comorbidity and the mortality ultimately that occurs it's very very tough no yeah. thank you so today we have some uh may so many nurses nurses on this webinar so I have one, some more another question for you. Is there, how do you manage the post-operative CSA freak during the lumbar drainage? So you mentioned about the three or five days you have to uh, the patient under the lumbar drainage is uh, installation. So how do you manage the post-operative CSA drainage uh, leak to avoid the CSA yes. leak? Thank you. Yes. First, the the first thing is most of these patients are either landing up into the main ICU or in the neurosurgical ICU. So the position of the lumbar drain that's one of the most important points. It should be lying at the level of the bed. It shouldn't be up at the level of the tragus. It shouldn't be left down just like the Foley's catheter. It shouldn't be done like that. Mm -hmm. That the the upper level of the lumbar drain it should be at the level of the back of the patient. So it should be just lying parallel to the Parallel, parallel to the back. No one is going to get the lumbar drain emptied except in front of the main nurse or the main surgeon at his rounds. It's not just like police that you can come and empty it into a bowl and then get it again drain it like that. Third thing, if there is a huge uh, uh, sorry CSF leakage which is yeah. not being controlled in spite of the lumbar drainage which is being placed, it is always always better to go in, have a look, and get. And get the and get the drain and get the leak repaired as soon as possible if there is a huge leak. Do not always rely on the lumbar drain if the if in spite of lumbar drain there is uh, there is an increasing CSF leak also. Get a complete uh, a complete counts for these patients. Get a vital chart. Get the temperature of all these patients. Any change in conscious level or any altered mentalness, that's the first sign of meningitis for these patients. So keeping a very good eye for these patients is of utmost importance for the for the for this first line of management that lie uh, that lie in the ICU of our, our nursing staff. That's very very important for them. Thank you. I totally agree with your comment. So, so the first uh, so another I have to mention about. I think uh, I'm pleased about... again. Uh, another point I, I have to mention to you is that we have to differentiate two different pathology. So we have we you we need to treat uh, as a skull base re surgeon to for the patient with a malignant skull base region or the benign skull base region. So for the malignant skull base region, as I mentioned in, in your presentation, we have to perform the unblock monoblock resection. So in such a situation, we have to reconstruct a uh, wide range of skull base defect. To avoid the CST leak postoperatively, so we have to change another another yes, treatment uh, strategy. Uh, I think I've I've shown a very yeah. Okay. Yeah, please continue. 
Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. So I, I just want to mention about the, the difference between the Scarabish uh, Manigrand region or the Benin Scarabish region. So we have to differentiate two different pathologies. So we have to choose another way to reconstruct the scarabase region. So when I uh, perform the unblock monoblock resection for the large scarabase, uh, malignant scarabase region, we, we need to perform the large pericranial flap. And of course, you have to pericranial uh, uh, fat tissue from the uh, abnormal fat tissue. So how do you reconstruct to the large scarabase defect? After the removing the malignant scarabish region. Okay, can you hear me? Matt? Matt? So maybe disconnected. I'm not. Ah, okay. I'm not. Can you hear? Can you hear me, Amat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now, you. right now, right now, I can. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. just, I just missed your question because I think there was some some okay, problems with you. my internet connection. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we have to perform the muscular abdominal flap, muscular cranial yes. flap. To yes. Yes. Uh, so that's why for these niches, which are which are involving the craniofacial areas, we are mm -hmm. always in collab. are the best people I would say who would be involving the free flaps or the LD, the let's do top side or any other abdominal graft flap that would uh, that the that the patient would uh, think upon. Most of these lesions, if yeah, if any, if they have any encroachment inside towards the skull base, these are the lesions have a very small area of the brain or the dura that has been involved upon. So it is relatively very easy. Particularly when we are reaching from the from upper aspect. So most of these two. There may be some uh, internet the connection problem. This, this is usually followed by or in collaboration with these people. They remove the anterior portion. Dr. Ahmed Ansari. Yes, Tim. How are you? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Hebazos, uh, do you have any comments? Um, yes, I do. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Tim, I just you. Okay. So I have uh, three comments about that, or three questions, if you if you might, about the reconstruction of the skull base. As uh, Professor Komura was asking, do you use like a three D printing uh, for reconstruction of the anterior skull base, especially if there is an ethmoidal uh, bone defect or a frontal sear wall defect, something like that? Would you do this? This is number one. Number two, uh, you've mentioned also the usage of lumbar drain. Yes. Um, uh, yes, uh, we have been using recently the 3D printers, but uh, they have been used mostly for complex spine surgeries or the as for now. We have been been been, uh, been using the, the 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 usage of our 3D printers in cases of uh, complex skull based lesions as for now. But I think it is very very useful, as you rightly pointed out, that these 3D printers can be very very useful in cases of all these complex lesions. So uh, the, the, the two questions about uh, the CSF leak mainly. So in, in case of lumbar drain and the frontal uh, or anterior skull based uh, lesions, some, some advocate that uh, the weight of the frontal lobe help in the decreasing of the CSF leak rather than inserting a lumbar drain. I don't know if you agree or disagree with this point. And the second question about also the CSF leak and using a transphenoidal endoscopic approaches for cellular lesion or something like that. Uh, sometimes you're not able to do a tight dural defect. So do you do the sliding knot technique or you just compress it with fat, something like that? And th that's, that's it. Yeah, I think the sliding sliding knot technique, as you rightly pointed out, is a very wonderful technique. Sliding knot technique, specifically when we are inserting inserting the 
as I, as I pointed out earlier. It's a wonderful technique. Uh, we don't regularly use a sliding knot technique, although although it can be very helpful in cases of uh, direct uh, dura with the patch uh, with uh, the patch stitches. If we have if we are stitching dura uh, the left out dura with a small piece of the patch directly inside the knot, the sliding knot technique is a very wonderful technique in that. Most of the of our of our cases we have been using uh, the two layer three tensor facial at as I had uh, earlier pointed out with uh, Dr. Kimura. The first layer of the facial atta it goes directly inside the dura. The second layer it helps. Uh, the second layer it overflows the dura as well as the first layer, and we place a simple suture over uh, over both of these uh, the layers, and we tuck it out and just, just pull it out so that it just gets completely fit out. The sliding knot technique is very very wonderful if we are stitching directly the dura along with these facial layers. It's a wonderful technique as we pointed out. Thank you. Any questions from attendees and also uh, commentators? Yes, yes please, uh, Dr. Dilshad Mahmoud Ali. Mm, good, uh, uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, uh, thank you so much for um, this very interesting presentation about skull base surgery, uh, Dr. Ahmed Ansari. Um, I have a question about uh, the reconstruction or cranialization of uh, uh, frontal sinus or any other sinus when we are uh, dealing with uh, craniotomy. Of, I lost uh, your the... voice. My voice is not good. Uh, it is perfect. Uh, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, do you hear me? Yeah, yes. yes, 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 yes. I okay. can hear you now. So, um, the question is uh, when we are uh, cranializing the uh, frontal sinus, uh, usually we try to close the uh, uh, frontal sinus uh, with any kind of material. Uh, in your series, uh, what kind of technique do you use in case of anterior skull base surgeries? Uh, While exteriorizing the frontal sinus? While exteriorizing yeah. the frontal sinus? Okay. Uh, for for me, and and uh, I have used this uh, a pretty lot of times, and I, I don't, I, I, and, I, and I haven't met any sort of uh, problems with the patients. Is I totally removed the, we totally removed the, uh, we totally removed the frontal mucosa. Complete, complete removal of the frontal mucosa is the one thing. Which is followed by a gel, a gel foam which is, has been soaked into the beta D, we directly inserted in one layer. This is followed by a complete obstruction of the frontal sinus with the help of bone wax. We completely seal the bone wax, uh, the, the the open frontal sinus with the with the with the bone wax. So that's one one thing. Complete removal of the frontal mucosa. Second thing is, is the gel foam which has been soaked in 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 beta D, directly uh, which is povidone iodine, directly. In, Side of frontal sinus, and the third thing is complete obscuration of the frontal sinus with the help of bone wax. That's how we have to write it. We don't use the pericranial free slab directly over the frontal sinus these days. We just we have just stopped doing it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, I think uh, the questions are. Uh, we we have answered to all of the questions. Uh, thank you for the very informative presentation on this uh, skull base approach and management of these patients. Uh, we got from this presentation very that the uh, there are very wide range of surgical approaches to, which depends on the actual lesion uh, size and the structures involved. And we got from this that the multidisciplinary team also is uh, very important, like uh, the collaborative work between the ENT specialists and the uh, plastic surgeons and also neurosurgeons. And also we got from this that uh, we should, should always consider the possible complications before the surgery and mitigate them as much as possible. And also uh, we should always look out from the, uh, for the uh, new techniques and approaches like uh, endoscopic uh, in skull base surgeries and to advance the field. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed Ansari. Uh, that's all in uh, first session. Yeah, thank, thank you, Tamil.
for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Temu, for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Thank you uh, for the elaborate presentation on uh, posterior cranial fossa tumors and various surgical approaches and uh, the precautions uh, to be taken to prevent complications in these patients. Now uh, we can move on to the nursing session. Uh, for that, um, the nursing session will be by two presentations uh, from the nursing aspects. Then two case studies will be presented by later sessions. Uh, let me invite uh, Professor Rebecca Sumadi Bhai. Uh, she's Professor of uh, Christian um, Medical College, uh, Vellur. And uh, Madam is the life member of Society of Indian Neuroscience Nurses, Trainers Nurses Association of India, and she has many more memberships. She had many national as well as international presentations and publications. Uh, let me uh, welcome uh, Rebecca Ma'am to chair the nursing session on posterior cranial fossa lesions, nursing management. Off to you, Ma'am. Uh, can you hear me, Shani? Can you hear yes. me? Yes, Ma'am. You yeah. are. Uh, thank you very much for those uh, kind words, and it's my pleasure to uh, come here and moderate the sessions, uh, the nursing sessions. We just heard a very extensive and uh, very wonderful talk by Dr. Ahmed. And uh, one of my surgeons always used to say, the surgery is very important for uh, any kind of brain tumors. And uh, equally important is the nursing care because to prevent general complications and the specific complications. And as we're going to discuss about the skull-based tumor, the nursing management, I'm happy to introduce two of our speakers uh, Christian Wong, who is uh, actually, uh, it's a long CV to cut short. Uh, Ma'am is has done her Master of Nursing and was a nurse practitioner, and she's got a critical care nursing certification. Uh, I'm happy that she has done her uh, Bachelor of Science in Nursing and also Human System Cell Biology. She is also the Organ and Tissue Donation Nurse Coordinator, has worked in the Intensive Care Unit, is a clinical preceptor uh, along with being a nurse practitioner in the University of Toronto. She's an educational coordinator and um, she is in the quality and safety committee, safe medication practice committee, and it goes on. I'm very happy to introduce Christian Wong to give us a talk. The second person that we have for this session is Vanessa Cherney. And I'm, uh, I hope I am pronouncing it correctly. Uh, she is uh, also a nurse practitioner who is in the neuro-oncology department, who has been a registered nurse in the intensive care unit. So uh, both of them working in the intensive care unit uh, will have a lot of knowledge to share with us. Um, so let us hear from them and over to Christian and Vanessa. I'm very glad that I'm able to introduce you and uh, welcome you for this presentation. Over to you. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm going to uh, share my screen. So uh, Vanessa and I are both the nurse practitioners here at uh, Toronto Western Hospital University Health Network in Toronto, uh, Canada. We work, uh, nurse practitioners are sort of a unique role to North America where we uh, sort of primarily function sort of like physicians um, and we work alongside um, some intraaxial and skull-based tumors. And uh, thank you for everyone for coming. And we're gonna be talking about uh, some of the management of patients um, pre and post-operatively for skull-based tumors. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So I'm Vanessa. Um, thank you, Dr. Ansari, for your great uh, presentation earlier. Um, I'm going to skip through these uh, first couple of slides as you have already um, touched on it. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk uh, you through um, the pre and post operative management of patients with cellar tumors, um, tumors that we often see here um, at Toronto Western are craniopharyngiomas and pituitary adenomas. So I thought I could walk it through um, how we care for these patients through a case study. So um, 
there's a 50 year old male who presents to the emergency department with a five month history of worsening headache and decreased visual acuity. Um, through further history taking, uh, the patient reveals that they have breast enlargement, decreased libido. And so when we perform the physical exam, you can see that their vital signs are relatively stable. Um, but through a cranial nerve assessment, you can see that there are some vision changes. Um, and in this patient's case, in particular, by temporal hemianopsia. So with these assessment findings, you, you know, we start thinking about maybe a, a pituitary lesion. And so for uh, further investigations and workup, we would do a full endocrine workup, including a pituitary hormone panel. Um, and we would consider an endocrine consult as well if there were any abnormalities. Given the vision changes, we would page our ophthalmology team and have them be assessed for a formal visual testing, visual fields. Um, and then the diagnostic imaging of choice would be um, an MRI uh, brain with a, within the cellar region. Um, and so you can see within these photos, these sagittal images that the green arrow um, in the first image is pointing at the optic chiasm. And when you see in the second photo to the right, um, there's a tumor there that um, is being, that's pushing up on the optic chiasm and likely causing this patient's uh, vision changes. So after reviewing the images, um, our leading diagnosis is a pituitary lesion, um, a pituitary adenoma. Um, adenoma is just another word for a gland plus a tumor. Um, there's microadenomas, which are uh, less than a centimeter, and macroadenomas, which are uh, greater than one centimeter. Clinical presentations, they can overlap, um, but there are three different kinds. An endocrine syndrome, which is... Um, where you do that hormonal panel um, and you can see some uh, clinical presentations with, for example, elevated uh, imbalance in the prolactin, amenorrhea, impotence, um, issues with the TSH, uh, you can have hyper or hypothyroidism. Another presentation um, is the tumor is causing mass effect. Uh, patients will come in with headaches, vision changes, as does our 50-year-old male, um, issues with their cranial nerves, and then lastly, which is more uh, urgent, is patients present with pituitary apoplexy, which is this lesion um, is expanding, it's causing hemorrhage, infarct, or necrosis. Um, and the presentation is often more severe, um, like sudden visual changes or you know, pounding headaches. So for treatment, um, depending on the tumor, for example, if it were a prolactinoma, we sometimes can just manage these patients with oral medications, um, but then, you know, sometimes that's not enough and surgery is required. Um, and so there's a transphenoidal approach, approach uh, of open craniotomy. Um, and for some patients, they also require um, radiation um, before or afterwards. So um, Christine and I, we see these patients before and after surgery. So immediately after a transphenoidal approach, uh, these patients go to um, we have a step down unit. It's not ICU and it's not the ward. It's kind of in the middle. Um, and, and here their, their vital signs are checked every one to two hours. We keep patients on flat bed rest for about 24 hours. We try to get a CT scan within that time frame as well, just to ensure there's no hemorrhage or infarct. We do a full pituitary panel and make sure we're checking their electrolytes at least every six hours for the first 24 hours as well. Oftentimes these patients uh, come out with nasal foleys um, in their nose. And so we make sure that they're on prophylactic antibiotics and we're checking their intake and output every one, uh, every one, one hour, sorry. Uh, they all come out with urinary foleys and those stay in for about 24 to 48 hours as well. Um, and then, you know, we perform uh, in-depth assessments, you know, GCS, headaches, nausea, vomiting, um, we're always monitoring for complications as well. So checking for CSF leaks, um, if they have increased urine output, any neck stiffness or rigidity. Um, and then a couple of post-operative complications that we, we, we can see um, among these patients. Um, the first one being diabetes insipidus um, uh, or DI, which is what uh, for short. So it's caused by low levels of uh, anti-diuretic hormone. So these patients will have very high outputs of very dilute urine. Um, and then they oftentimes are presenting with uh, hypernatremia and high serum osmolality as well. And usually they're very, very thirsty. Um, usually following transcranial surgery, it's often just transient. So it can happen within 24 to 48 hours. Um, and it's due to, you know, irritation of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. 
So when we see that this is happening, you know, we usually tell the nurses on the ward to page us or page the endocrine team if the patient is um, putting out more than 400 milliliters of urine uh, in two consecutive hours, and we'll have them send SAT um, serum and urine electrolytes and osmolality. And oftentimes we call the endocrine team as well to consider uh, the administration of DDABP or desmopressin. And then the last complication I'll talk about are cerebrospinal fluid leaks or CSF leaks. Um, this is due to um, the disruption of the barrier between the sinonasal cavity um, and the anterior or middle cranial fossa, which can occur following transponodal surgery. Um, you can see that there's a photo of a tap with water dripping down, and that is because um, that's kind of what the CSF leak is like. We'll ask patients, we'll assess patients, and if they're leaking like a tap, water coming from a faucet, um, we'll, we will start to get worried. And so if we see that, we send them for a CT scan um, to assess for pneumocephalus. We put them back on flat bed rest. Uh, we can collect um, the the uh, drainage and send it for beta-2 transferrin, which could tell us if this is CSF. And then if the bed rest is not enough, then we will have to go towards inserting a lumbar drain. And these patients, you know, they, they stay there for, you know, three to five days um, on bed rest with this lumbar drain. Um, and if that's not enough, they'll have to go back for surgery. Um, and with the CSF leak, there's it means there's probably exposure to the central nervous system. And so we are always monitoring and on high alert for uh, signs and symptoms of meningitis. So I'll take over from here. And I think that, you know, with what Vanessa has been saying is that you know, these are things that we want to talk about because we get paged largely from the nursing team and our allied health team about it. Like, oh, the a patient's saying that their nose is leaking like a faucet or they're having neck stiffness, so like neck pain and rigidity. Um, so some of the things that um, we also get called for are things like what, like what's what's in their nose, why is it there? And we know that um, intraoperatively, the nasal septal flap um, is used for reconstruction of the skull-based defect after transphenoidal surgery. And so to support that flap, we often, our surgeons will put in uh, mostly nasal Foley catheters um, that, of course, the nurses are very well versed with. It's the same catheter uh, for urinary catheter, and we put it into the nose with an inflated balloon to try to support that nasal septal flap. There's also evidence um, and lots of articles that uh, talk about gel foam, which is, I think, specifically Pfizer uh, cylinders to roll and wrap and, and, and pack. And we also use gauze packing as well. And uh, it's more like surgeon's choice, which one um, they choose to use, but here we see often nasal foleys. And it's also very important that when, uh, you know, if you, for us, it's usually four or five days after surgery, when we have um, sort of determined that there's, you know, there's no CSF leak, that we teach our patients about uh, nasal irrigation with uh, um, uh, saline. And so there's been good results to show that um, uh, saline irrigation after transphenoidal surgery um, significantly helps with dysomnia as well as any bleeding or nasal adhesions. And also from a longer term perspective, helps with olfactory disturbances like smell um, down the road. Another thing that we um, get called about a lot is vision. So, you know, patients will say, um, and I think in rounds we'll often ask, uh, how's your vision compared to before surgery? How's your vision compared to yesterday? Sort of uh, as a subjective trend. But a lot of nurses will call me and say, okay, it's like they're complaining of um, blurry vision. And the first question I always ask is like, well, did they have this before? And is it any different? So the visual defect comes, is a very common presentation in these patients. And um, we know that their visual field is often affected, especially for patients with pituitary tumors. And this is caused by the tumor compressing the optic nerve itself or the interior pathways leading to the back of the brain. So the most common um, visual field deficits in pituitary tumors are bitemporal hemianopia or quadrant Myopia. So, you know, you see here, uh, I think Vanessa had talked about in our case study, patients who um, present with pituitary tumors, we often see this by temporal hemianopia, where the side, the outer side of each side 
is is affected. So they only see the central vision. And this bottom here is just a just the quadrant of it is affected. And it could be on the same side or opposite side. They also see, uh, well, double vision. They see two of everything. And so um, that can be quite distressing for patients, especially if they've just had surgery, they feel a little bit awful, and now they can't kind of focus. People get nauseated, dizzy from having to see seeing double vision. So some of the things that we recommend doing is providing them with an eye patch. So blocking vision from, from one eye so that the brain can only see one image at a time so that the two images don't coincide. Um, if the double vision is mild, um, sometimes we can ask um, our ophthalmology colleagues to uh, place sort of prisms within the eyeglasses to shift the images and reduce the double vision. And then if it's really bad, then we think about doing things like surgery for chronic diplopia, which is often greater than 12 months. And it's it adjusts the position of the eye muscles. And the goal is to reduce um double vision when you're looking straight and down and less so is effective for double vision when you're looking side to side. Another um, skull base um, lesion that we see quite often here is the vestibular schwannomas. They're also known as acoustic neuroma schwannomas or neuromomomas. And they um, affect uh, nerves that are responsible for hearing and balance. So they're non-malignant, they're sort of outside of the brain coming in and they're not, they don't grow from within the brain. Um, and they grow from the sheath uh, surrounding cranial nerve eight. And if you look at an MRI, we often see, and we talk about this ice cream cone sign. So you see how this is, it's almost like the ice cream and the cone here. So that's when we start thinking about the fact that they have something called a schwannoma or a vestibular schwannoma. Some of the symptoms are, are dizziness, vertigo. They they don't have hearing on one side, the side that is that it's on. Lack of coordination, tingling or numbness to the face, uh, ringing in the ear. Um, sometimes, most of the time, it's one ear, but sometimes it can be both. Walking or balance problems, double vision, and sometimes trouble with their speech and swallowing. So. With vestibular schwannomas preoperatively and postoperatively, we think about whether or not they have facial paralysis um, or palsy. And so there's a, there's a grading system called House Brackman. Um, and you can see that there's grades one to six. It's hard to really distinguish like based on this picture because I think it's better observed with a video, like in sort of a dynamic um um, environment. So you can see on the bottom here, if they're trying to smile or lift their eyebrows, it becomes very apparent the level of um, palsy. And so I think it is hard to distinguish between, like, let's say a three here and a four. So if you look here, this section here, it's harder to distinguish between these two levels. And the distinguished factor is whether or not they can actually close their eye. And they can't completely close their eye. We have to really start thinking about postoperatively starting. Um, or preoperatively, eye lubrication. So for us, we use something called natural tears and sustain and lubricant. Um, I like. I feel like that's it's sort of common across the board that we try to do it as aggressively as possible. I've seen it as often as every two hours if it's really bad, um, especially when we start seeing redness um, or concerns for corneal abrasion, we would um, increase um, these... Um, uh, eye lubrication every two two hours and we also would call our ophthalmology colleagues and if indeed the eye is is being affected there's corneal abrasion there's redness we actually think about um, having the eyelids sutured together to ensure that um, the cornea isn't um, damaged so other postoperative complications of vestibular schwannoma are things like dysphagia. So they're, they're, they're silent aspirators. So for us, it's common in our practice that despite how they present or what they're saying to us, like, you know, we always say, how, how are you drinking? How are you eating? Are you coughing? Um, do you think like, things are stuck? Um, regardless of what they say, they're like, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. We still consult speech language pathologies to do a formal SLP consult and swallowing study. And um if there's any doubt, we often go straight to a barium video fluoroscopy uh, study to ensure that they're not silently aspirating. Um, of course, these patients um, 
have balance and in coordination issues. So we often consult our physiotherapists and occupational therapists postoperatively to help identifying um, their deficits and to help them with coping and consider things like rehabilitation and inpatient and outpatient perspective. And as um, as Vanessa already touched on, we we really 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 worry about CSF leak. <clears throat> From, and from these patients, it can be from the ear or the nose or the incision itself. So we have to be mindful. Um, and then we, we think about hearing issues as well. And a lot of times, unfortunately, they don't get that hearing back. That's the one piece that they always ask about. <clears throat> we know that vision sometimes can take some time. Like we always tell them, like, you know, give it a couple months. Um, it might fluctuate a bit because there's a lot of edema associated with surgery. Um, but give it a couple of months to see how your vision is. But hearing often, once it's lost, it's often then gone. Um, and then we also think about the the numbness to the face, which can be quite distressing for some people. Um, and that really uh, sort of plays into their ability to eat as well. So we think about adequate pain control and consider things for neuropathic pain like gabapentin. And I just want to sort of that, sort of the end of our presentation, but I want to share with you a, a very helpful um, patient education tool that is is publicly available. Um, if if um, you just go to this link here, it's developed by our team here at UHN, and it helps patients and families um, throughout their trajectory postoperatively after transphenoidal surgery. And it talks about things to watch out for, like uh, pounding headache, neck stiffness, fever, chills, things like infection that they should present to emerge, but it also in includes things like how to take care of your nose, ensure that you do your nasal saline rinses, um, and like not to blow your nose, not to uh, like bear down, um, more comprehensive and holistic um, sort of from head to toe. So that is publicly available. And, and of course, um, we're happy to share our presentation so that you can copy and paste uh, this link for your patients and hopefully sort of share some of that knowledge and develop your own wherever you might be. So that concludes the, the our presentation. Is, um, we're, we're happy to answer any questions here from Toronto. Thank you very much, Christine and Vanessa, for that beautiful presentation, and it was very vivid, and we could learn. And we have now uh, two of the nursing faculty with us, um, that is uh, Sapna and uh, Pooja. They are actually working, uh, Sapna is, um, just a minute, please. Um, uh, Pooja, Ms. Pooja has completed her master's in neuroscience nursing. And she will present to us a, a case a study. And uh, Sapna as well will present to us another case study. So once after that, we will uh, take the comments. Is that OK? Yep, that's great. Yeah, yeah, OK. Uh, over to Pooja and Sapna. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Thank you for the introduction. Can I share my screen? Yes, please. So good evening, uh, one and all present here. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for the uh, introduction. So uh, I'll be presenting a case on, uh, am I audible? Yes, but your screen yes, is you are audible. You're, you're audible, but can you, uh, your screen is not visible. Uh, am I audible? Yes, please continue with the presentation. So, uh, I'll be uh, presenting uh, a case on Petrus apex uh, meningioma. So uh, st uh, starting with the meningioma. 
so meningioma these are the most common type of primary central nervous system tumor which involve brain and spinal cord these tumor involve basically the meninges which are the three protective covering of the brain and spinal cord particularly these meningioma they originate from the arachnoid cells in particular which are the cells within the thin spider web like membrane and estimated uh, 371 people they are diagnosed per year with meningiomas and out of which 368 adults they are in the age between 15 and older an estimated uh, 2692 people they are living with this tumor and five uh, five year survival rate of the meningiomas is 63.8% so as the patient was diagnosed with petrous apex meningioma i'll be continuing with the location so where is the petrous apex located so petrous apex uh, is basically a pyramid shape uh, structure which is formed pyramid shaped structure which is formed by the medial portion of the temporal bone it is obliquely positioned in the skull base with its apex pointing anterior medially and its base located posterior sorry sorry for the inconvenience so uh, it is obliquely positioned within the skull base with its apex pointing anterior medially and its base located posterior laterally so as this is the ct scan which showing uh, the base of the uh, skull base with uh, this is the uh, structure showing the petrous apex so this is the petrous apex and as you can see this is the uh, petrous apex meningioma showing in the ct scan So now, what is petrous apex meningioma? So these are the tumor located along the anterior extent of the petrous temporal bone. So overall, petrous meningioma it represents five to ten percent of intracranial meningioma and six to, and it contributes about five. Uh, six to fifteen percent of the cerebral pontine angle tumors. So these tumor originate at or above the internal acoustic canal and impinges on the cranial nerve seven and eight and the brain stem. So as this tumor expand, it can invade the macular cave and subsequently impinges on the cranial nerve fifth and the temporal lobe. So uh, Doctor uh, Ansari has already well explained about the anatomy, so it would be clear with that. So now, what are the clinical uh, features? so what are the clinical features so petrous apex tumor they are often asymptomatic and present with the non specific symptoms such as headache retro uh, orbital pain and ear pain larger lesions or those close to the cranial nerve for example in the macular cave cavernous sinus and internal auditory canal they may cause cranial neuropathies which may include sensory neural hearing loss tinnitus vertigo due to the involvement of cranial nerve 8 diplopia because of the uh, involvement of the cranial nerve 3 4 and 6 facial pain uh, due to the cranial nerve involvement a uh, fifth cranial nerve involvement and the facial weakness due to the involvement of cranial nerve 7 so trigeminal and abducens nerve they are the most commonly affected cranial nerve in the setting of petrous apex diseases because of the close proximity to the macular cave so as they are also separated from the petrous apex by only a thin layer of dura mater So the primary treatment of these meningiomas uh, is the uh, surgical resection and radiotherapy with the excellent outcome. Tumor in the challenging locations such as deep along the skull base around the cranial nerve they have high rate of subtotal resection and complications. So meningioma in the cerebral pontine angle they grow from the petrous space and they are surgically challenging due to their uh, proximity to the brain stem, posterior fossa vasculature and cranial nerves. And the primary approach for the uh, surgical resection of the petrous space tumor they are retrosigmoid far lateral uh, transpetrosal approaches which are selected based on the tumor location along the petrous spaces now the uh, the patient's biographic data so patient was uh, name was shyam singh he was 50, uh, 57 year male uh, uh, resident of uttar pradesh and he was farmer by his occupation and he was admitted on 10th of uh, april 2023 uh, in uh, the hospital with the chief complaints of headache since 6 uh, uh, to 7 month which was continuous hollow cranial not associated uh, with the vomiting and difficulty in walking with swaying to uh, left side since 6 uh, to 7 months difficulty in hearing since 1 to 2 months uh, tinnitus nasal regurgitation uh, since 1 month changes in the voice in 3 to 4 months and diplopia which was binocular on left lateral uh, on left lateral gaze and in primary position and horizontally separated since 1 month so uh, based on this symptom and the investigation he was diagnosed to have left petrous apex meningioma and uh, with hydrocephalus for which he has undergone right mbvp shunting on uh, 10th of april after one month uh, of his uh, opd uh, visit and followed by the left uh, rmso uh, craniotomy and excision that is retromastoid subospital craniotomy which was done a uh, 12th uh, day after the uh, 
and PPP shunting. So how uh, uh, the uh, history of the present uh, illness. So patient initially, he came in the uh, ENT OPD on 10th of uh, March with the chief complaints of uh, difficulty in hearing, tinnitus, nasal regurgitation, and uh, headache, where uh, the pure tone audiometry was advised and and the sensory neural hearing loss of the left sound was found and he was under the conservative treatment treatment and referred to the neurosurgery. So uh, where in the neurosurgery OBD, he was evaluated for the above mentioned symptom contrast enhanced MRI was done, which showed the left patris apex meningioma with hydrocephalus. So for initially, the hydrocephalus was treated by the MPVP shunting uh, on the day of uh, uh, OPD visit uh, on and he was admitted there. And the patient was under observation for 11 days in the hospital, which was uneventful. And the uh, uh, post shunt CT was repeated. And then the plan for the electric surgery was made. And all the operative investigation as per the anesthetic uh, checkup uh, was uh, done and which showed the normal values. And patient was managed conservatively and he was prepared for the surgery. And uh, then what is VP uh, shunt? So as a, a VP shunt, basically it is a cerebral uh, shunt, which is used to treat the hydro to remove the excess cerebrospinal fluid. So uh, in our patient, the uh, OT notes of the VP shunt uh, states that the right phrasal burr hole was made and abdomen was opened, tunneling done, CSF flare under high pressure and shunt assembly done, distal flow confirmed and the distal end placed in the peritoneal cavity and the wound was closed in there. Followed by the VP shunt, what was the status of the patient? So as the uh, there was a decrease in the headache severity post VP shunt, but the hearing was per, uh, loss was persistent and patient uh, uh, nasal regurgitation, tinnitus and changes in the voice and diplopia, it was improved. So patient was afebrile and vitals were stable. He was hemodynamically, uh, hemodynamically stable and with the GCS E4, V5, M6 and muscle strength was 4 by 5 and pupil was equally reactive to light bilaterally. He was on oral diet, semi-solid and he was avoiding uh, by uh, self. Then uh, these were the ongoing physical examination uh, post VP shunt where uh, airway breathing and circulation patient was having patent airway and he was on uh, room air breathing pattern uh, show, uh, was normal with he was maintaining saturation and vitals were also stable with the uh, neurological status he was uh, fully conscious with the GCS 15 and pupil was 2.5 mm uh, reactive to light but left uh, uh, pupil was sluggish reactive to light and muscle power was 5 by 5 on the left upper and lower limb and 4 by 5 on the right uh, uh, lower and upper limb. Skin integrity, suture scar of the abdomen was clean and uh, uh, healthy. So this was a basic physical examination. So preoperatively, uh, based on the white as he was hemodynamically stable. So investigations, uh, CBC, uh, RFTs and coagulation profile, it was done, which was uh, within the normal limit. X-ray was also with a uh, short the normal finding. And he was on tablet uh, paracetamol uh, for the uh, headache and the uh, pantocid and the dexamethasone. So he was managed uh, uh, with these uh, medication preoperatively. Followed by preoperative management, as he was prepared for the surgery, he was shifted to the OT for the surgery that was left uh, RMSOcraniotomy. So these are the surgical notes where the lazy S shape incision was given and the dura was open in cistern, magna CSF was drained. So followed by the surgery, he was uh, shifted to the ICU, uh, which and surgery was completely uneventful. And uh, he was shifted to the uh, from the OT uh, to directly to the ICU uh, without uh, being uh, reversed from the endotracheal tube. So he was uh, shifted to the OT, uh, ICU with the endotracheal tube 7.5 cup and he was on bag and mask ventilation with the GCS E1 VT M1 and he was under sedation uh, fentanyl at the rate of 5 ml per hour. But the pupil of the patient was non-reactive to light uh, till the time, that time uh, bilaterally and muscle power as he was under sedation so it could not be uh, assessed completely. He was uh, uh, hemodynamically uh, stable uh, showing this vital sign except for the BP that that was 110, which was managed with a normal saline uh, at the rate of 100 ml per hour. And he was put on SIMB mode with the FIO2 100%, PEEP uh, 5 cm of water, respiratory rate 5, uh, 12, and tidal volume 450 ml. So he kept a uh, uh, NPO and uh, which was uh, adequate till the next day. So this, uh, uh, this is the ongoing post of physical examination. So first is the neurological examination. So where the level of consciousness ongoing uh, uh, was, a uh, patient was... Uh, recovered uh, from the uh, sedation with the GCS E4, VT and M6. So MMSC, mini mental status examination and cognitive function, it could not be uh, tested. Patient uh, was uh, intubated and since the patient was also having the left side hearing uh, loss. And uh, uh, 
motor function so uh, muscle size was bilaterally normal but the muscle tone fol uh, following surgery on the left side it was normal but on the right side he developed hypotonia and the muscle power also he developed uh, 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 hemiparesis of the right side with the muscle power 1 by 5 of uh, and uh, 4 by 5 of left upper and lower limb then the uh, cranial nerve examination. So uh, on the cranial nerve two, uh, he was having the left side uh, diplopia. Visual acuity could not be assessed, and uh, he developed the left lateral gaze uh, palsy following uh, surgery due to the involvement of uh, the uh, cranial uh, nerve third, fourth, and uh, uh, sixth, and also the due to the involvement of cranial nerve fifth and uh, seventh. So in the uh, cranial, uh, due to the involvement of the vestibular uh, cochle vestibular cochlear nerve, he was having the sensory neural hearing loss as these cranial now they are uh, very near to the uh, petrous uh, uh, apex and he also was having the weak gag reflex during the post-operative uh, period and uh, poor uh, swelling reflex. So respiratory status, he was uh, tracheostomized on the post-op day uh, one. So he was received on endotracheal tube, but on the second day, he was tracheostomized uh, based on the condition seven point, with a 7.5 mm uh, tracheostomy. Uh, he was having bilaterally wheezing sound uh, with the uh, uh, palpable pulses and the BP was also uh, uh, maintained and in the gastrointestinal he was uh, for the maintaining of the uh, nutrition and uh, monitoring of the uh, urine output he was having a uh, nasal rise tube and foley catheter in the musculoskeletal system he uh, I have uh, he developed right side hemiparesis following uh, surgery, and uh, uh, he was having assisted range of motion on the left side. On the integumentary system, the on the scalp, uh, as the uh, S shape incision or retromastoid uh, was made. So suture side was monitored uh, during their ICU uh, stay, during whole ICU stay, and it was uh, clean, healthy, uh, dry, and. Uh, so next is the post-operative uh, status. So I will be handing over uh, to the Sunja. Uh, good evening, all. Continue with the post-operative ICU status of the patient. As she was firstly uh, received in the recovery room, then transferred to the ICU uh, in uh, receiving status. Uh, firstly, in uh, on receiving the patient was on SMB mode of ventilation with normal pulse rate and patient was afebrile uh, and patient was hypertension for that the injection level flow low 20 mg was provided to the patient. At receiving the patient was having GCS E1 VT M1 because patient was under the sedation and people were not reactive to light uh, and we are not able to assess the muscle power of the patient. Patient gag was weak and uh, patient was kept on NPO and, and on IV fluids and uh, admitting to the police catheter. On day one, the patient was still continue on the SMU board of ventilation on the same status. The GCS of the patient was E4, VT, M6 and patient was conscious. Left side people was not reactive to light and right side it was reactive to light with 2 mm uh, dilatation. And uh, muscle power in right side was 1 by 5 because uh, in one post of day, patient have uh, developed the right side hemiparesis and in left side, it was 4 by 5 with the gag weak and uh, thick uh, mucopurulent secretions were present in the patient. And patient was still on MPO and avoiding to the poly, uh, poly scatter with normal urine outlook. On day second, the patient was still on uh, SMB mode of ventilation with G, uh, GCS E4, VT, M6 and uh, left side people was uh, sluggishly reactive to light with 2 mm dilatation and right side, it was reactive to light. Muscle uh, power was same as previous with weak gag and thick mucopurulent secretions were present and on day second the RT feed was started to the patient with 150 ml per 3 hourly and plain water 100 ml per second hourly and still buried through the follies catheter on day third, the same uh, status was continued that patient was conscious, but the left side pupil was not reactive to light and right side it was reactive to light. On day fourth, the patient condition get deteriorated as the patient become unconscious with the GCS even VT quadriplegia and the pupils were not reactive to light and on day 5th uh, the patient becomes stuporous with GCS E2 VT M5 and uh, on day 7th the patient may become unconscious and the condition of the patient get uh, deteriorated uh, and the AVG result shows the respiratory acidosis. Uh, then on day 8, the condition of the patient gets improved and the GCS of the patient on day 8 is E4, VT, M6 and patient uh, developed the hypertension for that the injection labetolol 20 mg was provided to the patient. People in left side was sluggishly reactive to light with 2 mm dilatation and in right side it was 2 mm reactive to light and muscle power was same as previous with uh, weak gag and thick mucopurulent secretions were present and uh, the patient was getting feed, uh, RT feed uh, and the uh, catheters was continued. On day uh, 12th, the 
patient was kept on CPAP mode of uh, ventilation and the win of trial was given and finally the patient was uh, win off from the ventilator on day 15th and with the GCS E4 VT M6 and on day 16, the patient was put into TPs with the stable vital and the GCS of the patient was E4 VT M6. The next are the invasive lines. As the invasive lines which were uh, present in patient were, as patient was on tracheostomy on 23rd, for, uh, 23 and still on tracheostomy. The NG tube was inserted on 19 for 23 and the uh, patient was continued with the nasogastric tube uh, and it was changed whenever it required. Police catheter was inserted on 22 April 23 and it was uh, continued and it was changed whenever it required. Central line was inserted in 22 April and it was removed on 12 May 2023 and MPVP shunt was done on 10th April 2023. 20, uh, these were the ABG values of the patient. Next are the post-op investigation. As all the investigation were done uh, post-operatively, which includes CBC, RFT, coagulation profile, and these were within normal limit. The post-op medication which were received by the patient were tablet amlodipine 5 mg OD, tablet DEXA 4 mg TDS, tablet doxophylline 400 mg BD, tablet PCM 1 gram SOS, syrup lactulose 2 tablespoons BD for 5 days and then SOS and uh, nebulization with dulin QID. Then the nursing care, which we provide uh, during the ICU stay of the patient, as main priority is the airway breathing and circulation. For that, we continuously monitor the vital signs of the patient. Lung sounds of the patient were ascultated and the head uh, of the patient were elevated to 30 to 45 degree. Uh, nebulization was done uh, along with the chest physiotherapy and we uh, do the suctioning uh, by using the aseptic techniques. The, for the neurological status of the patient, uh, we continuously monitor the GCS of the patient, muscle strength and the pupillary response of the patient and head of the patient was elevated to 30 to 40 degree. Uh, the patient was continuously on the RT feed 150 ml per 3 early and plain water 100 ml per 2 early as per order and we continuously monitor the intake and output of the patient and all the medications were provided to the patient as per requirement. For the prevention of the infection, we strictly follow the web bundle and we observe the patient for the complications uh, that is like uh, ventilator associated pneumonia, cortic epilepsy, and the surgical site infection or uh, increased ICP. Uh, the strict aseptic techniques were followed during all those uh, invasive or non-invasive procedures. And uh, as the patient was in, uh, initially on the drain, so the care of the drain was done and the suture site was clean and the healthy and the limb physiotherapy was done and the position uh, every two hourly was done. Uh, as the patient has not developed any further complication during the ICU stay, but for the prevention of the complication, DVT stocking were applied and the air mattress uh, were provided to the patient. Every two early positioning was done and the back uh, care was provided. Side rails were elevated to uh, reduce the risk of fall and the re range of motion exercises were assisted. Uh, uh, we strictly maintain the hygiene of the patient and the unit and uh, we assist the patient in activity of daily living. Uh, for, the emotion, uh, for the psychosocial and the spiritual need of the patient and the caregivers, the Psychological support was provided to the patient and the caregivers and uh, the education regarding disease and the treatment and prognosis was provided to the caregiver and the patient as well. as. And we also address the emotional and the psychological need of the patient. Then on day 18th, the patient was shifted to emergency ward 2 with uh, uh, GCS E4 VT M6. At that time, the patient was hemodynamically stable and patient was on room air. And we observed the patient for two days in uh, emergency ward, then finally planned for the discharge. And the patient was discharged on 13 May 2023. This was the hospital course of the patient as patient was recustomized on post of day one and the uh, patient was having poor respiratory drive for that the patient was kept on ventilator. We gradually tried to wean off the patient from the ventilator and after 15 days the patient was wean off from the ventilator and kept on the room air for three to four days and was maintaining the saturation. This was the condition of the patient as discharge. As the patient was discharged with tracheostomy and the patient was on room air with stable vital signs and the GCS of the patient was E4, VT and M6. Patient had right side hemiplegia so that power in the right side was 1 by 5 and in left side it was 4 by 5. Patient was tolerating the RT feed and the suture line was clean and healthy and patient still had the left grade 2 facial palsy with weak gag and the cuff reflex with persistent sensory neural hearing loss. The medication which were provided to the patient at the discharge were tablet AMLO 5MG, tablet DEXA 4MG TDS for the first five days, then the 4MG BD for the next five days, then 4MG OD for the next five days and then stop, tablet doxophylline 400MG BD which is a bronchodilator and tablet PCM 1 gram SOS, syrup lactulose uh, for five days and then SOS.
the discharge teaching which we provide uh, to the patient were as we advise the patient to do proper TT care and to change it every five days along with the nebulization. The chest and limb physiotherapy were advised to the patient and uh, daily bath over the operated area were advised. We advised the patient to take the high protein diet with adequate salt and uh, liquid through the RD. The, we uh, educated patient about the proper catheter care and we advised them to change it every two weekly. The DVT stocking was up, uh, over applied and an air mattress was applied with frequent change of positions. We strictly uh, advise the patient to adhere to the medication or to do the regular follow-up as advised. And uh, we advise them to attend the neurosurgery emergency OPD if the in case of any emergency, like if patient develop any new onset deficit, vomiting, fever, wound discharge, seizure, altered sensorium, and the loss of consciousness. The first follow-up of patient was done on 30 May 2023. That time the patient was having uh, tracheostomy and the rile tube and the, the, that uh, tracheostomy and the rile tube was changed and patient was having excess secretion at the time of follow-up. The vitals were stable at that time and the GCS of the patient was E4 BTM6. Power was same as previous as in right side it was 1 by 5, in left side it was 4 by 5. People in left side was sluggishly reactive to light with 2 mm dilatation and in right side it was 2 mm reactive to light. And the gag and the swelling reflex of the patient patient was weak uh, and we advised the patient for the follow-up after one month. The follow-up counseling which we provide to the patient at patient was advised about the respiratory rehabilitation which include the deep breathing exercises and the physical rehabilitation need to be continued. We advise the patient, uh, we provide the psychological counseling to the patient as uh, this disease is burdensome for both the uh, client as well as their family. Uh, it can, uh, so we uh, psychologically uh, provide the counseling to the patient and uh, chest and limb phase therapy was uh, done and regular monitoring of the vital signs were advised and we advise the patient to take medication as per prescription and we advise them to do regular follow-up as advice and to attend the emergency OPD in case of any uh, emergency. Uh, this was the comparison of the previous symptom of the patient with the post-operative status of the patient. As in previously, patient had holocranial headache, difficulty in hearing, nasal regurgitation, tinnitus, change in voice or the diplopia. And in post-op period, the patient has developed the right side hemiparesis and uh, the difficulty in hearing was still persistent and patient still had the weak gag and the swelling reflex and thick secretions were present in the patient. This was the status of the patient. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, uh, Pooja and Sapna. That's all. That was a very good presentation. And now we take uh, comments or questions for all four of them, for Christian Wong and Vanessa. Are there any questions regarding uh, nursing care of skull-based tumors? Kimura Sensei. Hi. Uh, I'm Hideko Kimura. So thank you for your excellent lectures, um, Miss Christian and uh, Vanessa. And of course, also um, Poaja. And uh, we, you did a so excellent presentation and congratulations. So first, I just want to ask about ask to Christian and Vanessa. So you mentioned about uh, uh, presentation, uh, especially in the nursing care for the patient with a pituitary adenoma, and of course, including, in, of course, and vestibular schwannoma and the typical tumor as a scar-based tumor. So what is the more, maybe a most, one is the most important point is to avoid uh, post-operative CSC free case, as you mentioned in, in your presentation. So in the standpoint from the nurse nursing care, what is the important point to avoid the post-operative complications in to, to avoid the CSA free case in the patient? Thank you. Post-operative status. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. So post-operatively to try and avoid CSF leaks is we make sure that we keep them on flatbed rest for immediately post-operatively. And we try to do that for 24 hours um, just to give, you know, the surgery a good chance to heal and avoid any pressure on that area. We also um, 
are really reliant on the teaching coming from us and coming from the nurses instructing patients, you know, if you're going to sneeze that you don't sneeze through your nose. If you, you know, are going to have a bowel movement, try not to bear down too hard. We, we make sure that these patients are on standing laxatives so that it, we make that process easier for them. Um, we, you know, tell them not to bend their head over. Don't do anything where their head is, you know, in that kind of position. Is there anything else that I'm missing? Yeah, no, I think like that's all part of it. And I think from like, uh, we sort of sit somewhere between like we're nurses by background, but we sit somewhere between our surgeons and, and the nurses themselves. But I think when we think about um, sort of more the medical side of things, um, we often like it's within our surgeons practice to um, have prophylaxis um uh, antibiotics for at least 24 hours after surgery. And that's given that they don't have a nasal foley. Now, if they have a nasal foley or any type of packing, they would have flagell and sphazole and IV uh, around the clock until those that packing uh, or the foley comes out. And even when the foley and the packing comes out, we often do at least one more dose afterwards, just as prophylaxis. Um, I think it's hard sometimes, like, you know, the, the, the defect and nasal septal flap and its, its healing process, um, it's it's mostly factorial, but I think when it comes to um, nursing and nursing care, I think it's if there's any, you know, we very much, very much rely on our nurses to have to to perform um, detailed and accurate assessments to give us clues uh, as if if we should be further investigating, like doing a CBC or sometimes even a lumbar puncture, etc. So it's more about the education piece. Um, to them to to be like the eyes and ears and our, our frontline people there. Thank you. So the next question is, when do you need to call the doctor to avoid to when the, if you are, uh, if you uh, if you feel uh, the patient suffered a CSS leakage post-operative. So if when you think about the patient needs to be emergent operation reconstruction surgery, what mm -hmm. point do you think about patient suffered patient needs to call a doctor? Thank you. Um, we, so Christina and I are pretty, we're capable of working them up. So we'll be able to send them for the CT scans. We'll be able to order them to go on bed rest. We will, we're always keeping our doctors and residents in the loop um, mm -hmm. every day. Oh, but if, uh, yeah, we work very closely with them, but you know, if, if we see a patient and they're dripping like a faucet, as I mentioned earlier, we will definitely, we tell our staff right away. Um, or and in the meantime, you can or, call it, yes. Thank yeah, you. and I think it's part of our, our daily, so like, um, our, I know our team structure is a little bit funny. It all sounds um, quite different sometimes, but like part of our assessments every morning, um, like our residents were around at like six in the morning and then they would do some same assessment and then we'd come in during the day and see them again from a medical perspective. Um, but one of the things that we, we do is uh, after the bed rest period, initially post-operatively, we sit them up and we lean them forward mm -hmm. and we wait like for like five minutes at least to see if whether or not they're dripping from the nose. No. I think the harder part is distinguishing between like what is normal mucus versus CSF. Um, and which is why it was, um, we always talk about this faucet. I'm like, do you feel like your nose is dripping like a faucet? Are you having leaking at the back of your throat? Mm, You're tasting yeah. salt or metallic. Like, are you tasting those things? Um, which is sometimes confounding, right? Because you have obviously everything's connected um, mm. and you have a bit of blood in your nose. And of course you taste the metallic of blood in, in the back of your throat. So like, the common things that nurses should call let's say us or physicians for would be things like active leaking especially when sitting up or walking or that they're um having pounding headaches neck um stiffness photophobia like the really obvious um like sensitive to light things like fevers chills night sweats those are the things that we would be most concerned about um and ask that you know they call call us a more urgent basis but you know most of the time it's, it's we get a lot of calls about something coming out of the nose mm -hmm. and it's kind of to figure out whether that's like csf or is that just yeah. normal yeah mm -hmm. thank you for your excellent explanation <laughs> thank you i i totally agree to your uh, your opinion thank you Nice. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. So, and another, uh, I, I just want to ask up to the Poger, that's Poger, Miss Poger, and uh, excellent presentation. So, you mentioned about uh, 
the post-operative uh, uh, pre and post-operative patient with uh, petrous apraxia meningioma. So I I still wondering about the, why the patient suffered the post-operative hemiparesis of the patient. What happened to the patient? I still wondered about the. Uh, but uh, in this nursing uh, uh, session for the patient, uh, for the nursing present nursing for the post-operative patient, I just want to about your your comment, your your representation. So what is the point to 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 avoid uh, to the patient with the suffered hemp paralysis post operatively. What's the main? Why, what is the important point for you for your standpoint? Thank you. Thank you, uh, sir, for the uh, question. Uh, sir, the main reason uh, for uh, developing the uh, this right side hemiparesis, as the uh, we have explained, the anatomy of petrous apex. So it is a very uh, the adjacent structure. They are highly vascular, and uh, also there are a lot of uh, cranial nerve uh, that uh, tumor these may involve uh, these. So it. Uh, it might be uh, the improper vascular injury uh, in the surgery uh, that can cause uh, the uh, uh, hemiparesis in the patient. So that uh, could be the reason for uh, developing the uh, hemiparesis. Yeah. But of course, yeah, we can understand. Sometimes it may occur for the patient with a uh, deep seated scarabase tumor. So, so what is what is the point for you to to manage the post-operative patient from the point of, standpoint of nurse if the patient have suffered a hemiparesis post-operatively? The patient needs to be some needs some assistant to perform some some daily care or uh, to work difficulty maybe. You, so you need to assist for the patient to work to other rehabilitation. So you need you need some uh, help for the patient. What is the main point for your uh, point, nursing point? Uh, sir, I mean the nursing uh, point for the patients yeah. with the hemiparesis is the yeah. positioning, uh, the elevation of the extremity, hemiparetic extremities, and uh, the prevention of contractures with the proper range of motion of that uh, uh, extremity. And uh, so exercises are very important. Uh, in the physical rehabilitation mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and uh, the uh, maintenance along with the this hygiene of the patient because as a patient is not able to perform his own uh, activities yeah. so the assistance is very important so nurses role are very important in the patient uh, carrying a patient with the right uh, side uh, hemiparesis uh, so the this these are the point that uh, we uh, need to cover and uh, also if the uh, along with the uh, physical rehabilitation the patient uh, uh, he uh, might uh, develop the respiratory uh, complications uh, uh, as well because the patient may be on the bed. So, so prevention of the uh, pneumonia, uh, that is another aspect that we need to uh, take care uh, in these patients. And as this patient uh, was also having a weak uh, gag reflex, so... Uh, and uh, and this patient was also having a, a lot of secretions. So we have uh, advised the patient about uh, the uh, suctioning uh, with the proper aseptic technique and uh, the uh, chest physiotherapy. We have uh, taught uh, the patient's attendant as uh, uh, in the home so that they can uh, 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 give the chest physiotherapy to the patient and report if any symptom uh, of complete uh, in uh, any symptom of pneumonia uh, that they need uh, they need to report to the uh, uh, no. uh, 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 treating doctor. Doctor. So, uh, yes. Of course, another important point is to avoid the uh, DVT if the patient yes, has, has oh, yes. Yeah, very, the very DVT. important point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So, how about uh, Timor? Yeah, do you have a sub comment? Timor? <coughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I was also. Uh, I was impressed from uh, both of the uh, lectures. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for uh, for the first uh, lecturers, the uh, Miss Christine and Miss Vanessa, I want to ask. Uh, I, I wanted to ask the same question as you asked about the when they uh, decide to call the neurosurgeon, for example, if there is a CSF leak, uh, or they call the ENT or the neurosurgeon, and when uh, do they call the uh, neurosurgeon to change the antibiotic, for example, if there is a meningitis or something. Uh, it is very interesting because in our country, uh, nurses are not uh, 
uh, do, do not have this kind of autonomy. And uh, of course, this is very good for neurosurgeons. Uh, they are free, they can only do surgery and the rest of the uh, very important work will be done by the nurse practitioner. Thank you to all, all of the lecturers. Thank you very much. Okay, so any, and have a sensei? You have any uh, um, question? Yeah. Thank you, Professor Kato. Um, actually, um, it's very impressive, both presentation, uh, Christina, Vanessa, and Puja and Spana, if I'm pronouncing all the names correctly. And I want to ask a question for, uh, for both of you, or for the four of you. Um, what do you think that should we reinforce uh, the connection between the doctors and the nurses? Uh, in the education process, or maybe to give them an insight about the operation details. What do you think is uh, it's missing in the communication between the surgeon and the nurses that people should, or we should focus more on or highlight it more in the future? Anyone wants to start? Uh, Hiba, can I answer that question? I'm from, I'm Rebecca from uh, CMC. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, here uh, pertaining to uh, how the communication between the surgeons, what we do in our system is uh, as the patient is wheeled out from theater, they come straight to intensive care unit as uh, is most in, in most of the countries. And uh, the doctor who is the surgeon also accompanies the patient and he explains, uh, not in a detailed manner, but he tells the nurse, the in charge of the patient, what exactly he wants and what has happened inside, both the intraoperative phase, you know, what happened inside and a, a quick dialogue between them. And then the notes are written down. So the nurse is able to understand and then it is passed on to each shift, to, to every shift nurse. So that way, I, I think uh, I, we are quite fortunate about that and uh, about all the, the bed rest or the when we are going to put the lumbar drain or is it needed, all that is being discussed between the surgeon and the nurse. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, if, if any of you also have a different comments or... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. Dr. Manju Dandapani. I'm uh, working in PGA Chandigarh. I'm from India. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Yoko Kato and uh, my friend uh, Ching and uh, other AC and then board members for organizing uh, this wonderful seminar. It was really very good because we could, uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Ansari's uh, talk, we came to know about various approaches and uh, the different parts of the skull base and the tumor in each, of each area of the skull base. And uh, we also got the opportunity to uh, have discussion on various types of skull base tumor, like through four presenters. Uh, so I would like to appreciate that and um, and many of the discussions were going on and uh, something I would like to add about the uh, CSF leak. So as uh, uh, Christine uh, told, it is like a flat position we give and we take all the measures to prevent CSF uh, leak. But however, we know that there is a chance that CSF, it is sometime inevitable and the patient develops CSF leak. So you know that uh, sometimes the patient is out of ICU and they are with the patient's caregivers, so nurses and uh, neurosurgeons are around. So we need to really educate the patient's caregiver to, so that they don't misunderstand this as well, like, you know, as a nasal drip or a just a rhinorrhea. So they have to really understand that there's a chance of developing CSF rhinorrhea. They need to immediately report. And as well as if the rhinorrhea is there, how to handle it. We need to provide them with a sterile pad so that they don't just any use any handkerchief or any towel to just blow the nose and uh, things. So we need to, it's very important as nurses for us to educate them uh, if uh, that develops. And again, when the patient is on lumbar drain, so yeah, we put lumbar drain. So if lumbar drain is there, again, the patient education is very important. Mostly like, you know, that the police uh, urinary bag and the lumbar drain bag looks similar as well. So they may handle this uh, with the same casual attitude towards the lumbar drain as well. So it is very important for us to educate the caregivers and nurses, obviously, they should have the knowledge and we believe, we think that they have the lack of knowledge, we need to tell them also. Sometimes even nurses mishandle with that. So uh, these two few things. And also, uh, when we talk about the uh, endoscopic or microscopic uh, transnasal surgery patients, transphenoidal surgery patients, 
so they may have nasal pack or police police we don't have often we don't keep and pack also we uh, nowadays remove uh, uh, on the post, zero post operative day only and we know that they will but continue to have postnatal drip of bloody discharge or maybe it can be csf for some time so we need to inform them if it is increasing they need to inform us they are encouraged to uh, breathe through no uh, mouth or uh, if they are having pack so that time we need to realize that because we have done a qualitative study and we need to realize that they'll be having a lot of throat dry dryness especially because of the blood bloody like discharge which is going through the nasopharynx so they'll be having a lot of dryness so it's very important for us to uh, give good mouth gargle and uh, oral care to these patients so that they, they again don't feel the taste of blood which again affect their oral intake so so they are usually allowed to have oral intake so uh, it can affect their oral intake uh, so already they are having problem with the smell and other things so we have to make this aspect also very clear and uh, some other studies which we are doing in the uh, you know in uh, <clears throat> especially cellular supracellular tumor one is uh, di bundle di dietary, diabetes insipidus dietary bundle we have developed uh, so two years back this published in journal of advanced nursing where we have told the patients and the caregivers we educated them to avoid uh, any uh, you know to drink only water uh, if they feel thirsty and to avoid any hyper osmolar like any drinks with salt or drinks with you know sugar like whenever a patient is hospitalized you know have we have a tendency to supply with them them with juice say, when they are, whenever they are thirsty because they are patients they need special care but we need to understand that these patients can uh, develop this problem so we have uh, you know utilized this and um, and again high protein drinks we have to avoid so that they this has shown effectiveness in uh, development of di less use of vasopressin and uh, less prevalence of hypernatremia and early discharge from hospital so this is one of the important step i believe and other than that we also have uh, uh, you know then a study like this is we have implemented pituitary nurse counselor you know that they have vision and a lot of problems from the pre operative phase on ways so and post operatively what all things they have to you know expect and uh, even during follow up they are having sino nasal symptoms and poor sino nasal quality of life so <laughs> these things need to be assessed even during the follow up of the patient so we have uh, done a study uh, where we have implemented a pituitary nurse counselor where the patient uh, she can where she or he can assess the patient and manage the patient from the admission uh, during the pre operative phase itself that also was found effective in reducing the psychological symptoms you know that this patients develop a certain amount of psychological symptoms as well during the post operative period whether they improve or deteriorate uh, so whatever it is so the, they have the patients were found to improve uh, have improvement in their psychological symptoms and uh, they were educated about this how to do the how to address the sino nasal symptoms and uh, they have to report and uh, they how they can improve the sino nasal quality of life and other thing is that now one study which we are doing is visual rehabilitation those patients who are having visual deficit like whether it is diplopia or blurred vision so we are developing uh, visual uh, you know rehabilitation uh, in collaboration with the um, ophthalmology people so we are, it's in the process so like it's not that to improve vision or uh, visual acuity but we know that it is you know the, this kind of nursing intervention it may not be improved but we are teaching them to live with the visual deficits whatever they have and uh, some of the visual exercises and scanning process and many other things so as soon as the result is out we will be publishing it Mm -hmm. and um, yeah this very important thing something which the uh, with the pituitary patients and uh, again the knowledge on vasopressin and different routes of administration so i think nurses who are caring for these patients often need cnes and uh, you know uh, special education uh, about the care of this patient and next was about uh, vestibular uh, schwannomas so in this patient the major post operative challenge we know that that we face they all already they may be having hearing um, you know deficit and uh, impairment in hearing and they'll be having poor gag reflex so post operatively weaning this patients and getting them extubated is a big challenge for the neurosurgeon neuroanesthetist and neuronurse 
who are caring for this patient. So collaborative um, care and uh, discussion and management, you know, multidisciplinary, and even the uh, respiratory therapist, uh, that means physiotherapist who is giving respiratory rehabilitation. So we all have to really work together so that these patients, if possible, can be extubated. And in our case, like one of the petrous effects we have discussed was like from PG education to was discussed, could not be extubated again because the patient was uh, deteriorated in between and the trials made they put the patient into acidosis. So it's very, but yeah, some of the patients are easily extubated and some of the patients are difficult to be and some are very impossible to be. So, you know, like uh, if we have a and preventing aspiration. So I would sometimes feel that caring these patients are more challenging than caring a patient who is on ventilator and stabilized because these patients are having high risk of aspiration and, um, you know, desaturation and everything during the weaning process. Uh, so I think these are the things and that Petra sac affects the tumor which Pooja and Sapna presented. There was a question that why the patient developed hemiparesis. Yeah, obviously uh, it was the, the, though there was no documentation much on, but uh, it was reported that uh, it may be due to intravascular, intraoperative vascular injury and uh, care. So this patient needs additional care, rehabilitation and multidisciplinary rehabilitation. Now, so they are uh, doing patients on tracheostomy. Doing the, again, day before a study, we had followed up that patient, doing form-based rehabilitation for that patient. Thank, thank you. you. So, thank you so much. Uh, once again, congratulations to all the presenters and all the others. Okay. Thank you very much. On the very, very final, maybe I, I we can some comment from Kelsey from from US. Yes, um, I just want to thank Pooja Sanya, Christine, and Vanessa for excellent presentations. And I think you underscored the importance of having great nursing care and taking care of these patients and improving their outcomes. Um, the nurse practitioners have a, an in-depth understanding of the pathophysiology and they teach the bedside nurses and the nurses therefore understand what's happening. And I think that really helps in uh, assessing the patient and being on the alert and, and having keen observation for any complication. I think communication is extremely important between the nurses and the surgeons because uh, the nurses are the eye in the sky, so to speak, and they know what's going on while the surgeons are in the operating room and can alert them to problems. And I think that improves patient outcomes. So thank you for your great presentations today. Thank you. That's ready. Professor Rebecca, thank you. Would you like to conclude? Yeah, thank you very much for uh, that presentation, Christian, Christina and uh, Vanessa and Pooja and Sapna. Uh, it was very extensive and it was very clear to all of us. Thank you very much. And thanks, thanks once again for this opportunity to listen to all the presentations. Thank you. Professor Ka Kato would like to make any comments yes. or closing? Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, of course, including uh, uh, Ahmad Anzari uh, and also the four, uh, the excellent talk from a nurse practitioner uh, from Canada and also India. Uh, my uh, understanding of the, the uh, missed, uh, uh, the year, year, the uh, uh, hospital uh, from Toronto, Toronto West, 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 Toronto Hospital is very, very famous. And I know that so many doctors uh, from your place. So all the best for your, the, uh, the patient uh, as a nurse practitioner. And also the, the uh, two nurses from India, the, the thank you very much for a nice uh, presentation. And the, the India is very, very promising uh, countries in the future. So I think uh, uh, we trust your work uh, in the future. So the Timo, you want to say something? Kim Rasen say, please. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. To conclude, uh, actually, a posterior posterior tumors are really challenging for nurses as well as neurosurgeons. We have heard uh, from them. With the advent of newer diagnostic uh, imaging technologies and <clears throat> microsurgical uh, techniques and neuronavigation techniques, most of the tumors they are removing with 
minor mortality or a morbidity uh, to the patient. But at times, uh, we may receive patients with intraoperative complications, which may uh, <clears throat> cause uh, deficits to the patients. So that will be um, really challenging for the bed nurse, nurses to care for this patient. So these patients require a comprehensive care uh, to prevent complications in the eye aspiration and balance problems, vision problems, hearing problems. So we really experience in our clinical practice, uh, it's a challenging to care these patients. Uh, we could highlight most of these aspects um, in this seminar, in the webinar, uh, to highlight uh, the care of these patients. Um, so actually it is very a good seminar we had today. I thank uh, no, Professor uh, Dushanov, Kemura, Heba, Rebecca, ma'am, and Christine, Vanessa, Pooja, and Sapna for your wonderful, wonderful presentations. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you once again. Thank and I thank, thank uh, Professor Yoko Kato uh, for your uh, initiative uh, in creating this nurses forum and leading all our webinars and being present and uh, being commenting on all the aspects and guiding us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll be having our next webinar uh, somewhere in the third week of uh, September. I invite you all uh, to that webinar also. And the topic and exact date will be shared later on. And uh, thank you all once again on behalf of um, Professor Matron in also in her absence. Thank you. Thank, thank you. All. you. Thank 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 you. Bye bye. 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 Bye Bye, thank you. Bye bye, bye. thank you. Bye bye, bye bye. bye, bye. bye, bye. Yeah. Thank you, bye bye. bye. Sir. Sir. Hello? Yeah, well present there. Good evening, good evening. Yeah? Hello? Hello?